بسم الله بسم الله اوكي Alhamdulillah, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa brothers and sisters. Thank you for joining us uh, once again. Uh, we've been having back to back streams last night, as you guys know, we had uh, a very interesting uh, panel with all the brothers and uh, asking the Christian uh, brothers uh, to join in. And we had a very fruitful uh, discussion yesterday. Uh, but Alhamdulillah, I'm really, really, really pleased uh, and blessed, Alhamdulillah. To have a, a brother like Yusuf Ismail on the show today. Yesterday. Let me just... Yeah, so guys, I do apologize for the echo. Uh, so yeah, brother Yusuf Ismail is uh, from South Africa, studied in the University of Natal in Durban, South Africa. Uh, by profession, brother Yusuf uh, Ismail is a lawyer. Uh, studied in international law. Also, Brother Yusuf Ismail was uh, with the IPCI, which is a very famous and profound organization. I remember in the early 70s and 80s, like Ahmed Idat and other uh, individuals in that caliber, uh, you know, uh, gave and offered information and literature regarding how to debunk uh, Christianity or the arguments for against Christianity. And uh, also, uh, Brother Yusuf uh, Islam, sorry, Yusuf Ismail is uh, with the South African Debate Initiative. And it's a channel on YouTube, brothers and sisters. So I recommend you, brothers and sisters, to go ahead and like and subscribe to the channel, uh, the South African Debate Initiative. And uh, Brother Yusuf uh, started debating or having discussions with famous or well-known Christian apologists in 2007, such as the likes of Jay Smith and others. Uh, Brother Yusuf, welcome to Cover FF, and I'm really honored and pleased to have you on the show. Uh, how, how is everything? Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and thank you, Brother Muhammad, for hosting me, and uh, Brother Mustafa, and the other brother. It's an honor and a privilege to be with you, esteemed brothers, that are basically sharing the information out there, and certainly. Um, you know, we, we are in, in certainly in trying times. It's um, depressing times. We're reaching the end. This is the 31st of December where people will be celebrating the coming of the end of the year in sometimes gluttonous fashion. Whilst they are celebrating, people are dying by the moment as we speak in Gaza. And you, you see a profound uh, surreal situation in terms of which, you know, you get yourself involved in. If you're an empath, you would be perpetually depressed by what you see. It's shocking. It's unheard of. It's probably one of the, you know, most barbaric, shocking scenarios we've seen in modern times over the past 20 or 30 years. So the situation doesn't bode too well for our brothers in the Muslim world. And that's what we are here for, to discuss and, of course, to galvanize the public out there uh, to take action at some level. Yeah, thank you for that, Yusuf. Uh, also joining us is our beloved brother, Mustafa. MashaAllah, uh, recently he's been uploading, or the channels have been uploading some of his uh, dawah efforts at uh, various locations. And I just want to quickly remind before brother Mustafa starts uh, that we have been kind of like touching this topic for maybe a year or so. And now we've come to this level where we've got brother Yusuf joining us and, and going into more depth uh, regarding this topic, uh, regarding Zionism. Uh, Brother Mustafa, I do recall yourself opening this can of worms. Uh, how do you feel now that from where we started and to where we are now, how do you feel the progress has been, mashallah? 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all our audience and to our esteemed guest, Brother Yusuf Ismail. And Jazakallah, Brother Muhammad, for giving us an opportunity to host this very important stream today. So, yeah, I mean, these are uh, topics which I've touched upon on your channel going back perhaps nearly two years. The Zionist influence on, on the West in particular and the way they seem to have the very uh, grip, their very grip is to such an extent that people are subdued by it They're from the from the mannerisms in which they conduct their affairs to how they um, essentially propel their narrative and impose it upon the um, the masses and we are all under a whip which is unheralded and um, i've been touching upon certain points and brother yusuf will today um, elaborate much further in regards to the um, events which have been taking place, particularly in Palestine, giving a great overview of the historical context in which these uh, matters have unfolded, and we'll be looking considerably um, at the, these particular points. So, I mean, the show will be dedicated to Brother Yusuf in this regard, and then we can have a, perhaps a discussion um, once he has completed his overview, in which we can invite the audience to discuss these matters. So, yeah, I mean, this is something which is long overdue, uh, giving a much more elongated and detailed account of the historicity of the Zionist movement and how it, today's world it is perpetually being, um, you know, supporting the atrocities which have been taking place in Palestine and which is all vis very visible. And as Brother Yusuf so um, uh, correctly mentioned, whilst this uh, year now comes to an, or draws to an end, people are celebrating whilst people are dying. I mean, the paradox in history is uh, savage to say the least. So we really want to get, delve into this topic and um, we are privileged to have Brother Yusuf to elaborate on those points. Yeah, you know, Brother Yusuf, one thing here in the West, especially living in the UK, uh, unfortunately, the, the people, the mass, the mass population seem to understand that this conflict started on the 7th of October. But yeah. with your studies and your uh, research, when did this conflict actually start and how did it come to pass? Or how did it initially trigger uh, the whole, you know, situation that we are currently right now in? Yeah, thanks, uh, Brother Mohammed and Brother Mustafa. Um, I think that that's a kind of a, a talking point. And, I, you know, for the first time, I never watch these shows, but they, they've become so popular. Piers Morgan Uncensored. We never watched him before the 7th of October. Uh, Talk TV. I've now discovered that Talk TV is owned by News Corp, which is controlled by Rupert Murdoch. And that seems to be the constant talking point about 7th of October. <laughs> Do you condemn Hamas? Uh, what's your take? So it, it it basically, in a sense, it puts you in the automatic position of defense. And even some of the Muslim brothers out there who come out and in fact condemn Hamas, I understand that Hamas is proscribed in the United Kingdom as a supposed terrorist organization. The, the hypocrisy of the entire situation in light of the fact that your government, the UK government, has been responsible for some of the worst atrocities, I mean, in the world. I think your own politician, George Galloway, once uh, when questioned, pointed out that uh, you know, your government under Blair killed one million people in Iraq. So it's a height of cynicism that this nation prescribes another organization as a terrorist organization, notwithstanding the fact that in the 80s, it also designated the ANC and Nelson Mandela under the Thatcherite regime as, as terrorist outfits. So this is basically the, the, the sense of the duplicity, the double standards and the hypocrisy. And unfortunately, when we fall into the trap of believing that history began on the 7th of October, or we, got, we, 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 we buy directly into the narrative of condemnation, we automatically basically put ourselves in the back foot. So, you know, coming to the root of the question, where did this begin? Where did this start? And I think, Brother Mustafa and yourself, uh, from what you've informed me, have gone into detail with this. But the actual, you know, Zionist movement, at least, and I'm, I'm kind of ridding it of its so-called religious undertones, but the actual modern Zionist movement was founded or formed by one individual, Theodor Hetzel, who was by no means a religiously minded Jew. He was secular. And he wrote a, a pamphlet um, called uh, uh, Der Judenstadt, the Jewish state, I think it was sometime in the 1890s. And the, the whole aim of that was to envision the founding of a future independent Jewish state during the 20th century. That was, that was the entire thrust of it. The thrust was basically, let's create this homeland for Jewish people in Palestine. 
or wherever the area is. And, uh, you know, it, it essentially emerged, I may add, as a result of the, the rising um, forms of anti-Semitism. And I'm saying anti-Semitism in a particular context because we're talking about European hatred towards other white Jew people who were designating or calling themselves Jews because these were white people. These were white European individuals and they were subjected to persecution based, of course, on their purported um, um, affiliation towards Judaism or something that was basically viewed as strange. And so from the 1890s right up going to the 1940s, the whole aim or the goal of the Zionist movement was to basically establish homeland. Now, I may add, and I read this somewhere, I think it's in this book, which I would highly recommend to your uh, viewers to get. A fantastic book by Sami Hadawi, who was basically a Palestinian scholar who lived in Jerusalem in 1904. And he worked as an official land valuer uh, during the British mandate uh, in the period of Palestine. And he made the point that Initially, when Zionism or when the Zionist movement were calling for the establishment of a Jewish homeland, they had different places in mind. They, for example, and I, I was quite surprised to note that they had a country called Uganda in Africa as a possible uh, uh, potential uh, Jewish homeland. They had uh, a certain uh, aspects, um, you know, in Argentina. This was obviously before the balkanization process. So you didn't have kind of nation states that had been essentially formed. And um, so these were alternatives that they were looking at. They were looking at Latin America, South America, parts of Africa. And so it was not a, it was not a, a kind of a, um, a, a foregone conclusion that the land Palestine or what was then basically under the Ottoman control was going to be eventually what basically became Israel. Although that would have been the likely outcome or the determination by these individuals. But they looked at various alternatives. And so eventually, um, you know, through a series of, um, of um, recommendations made by them, you know, a large number of Jewish people, they, they uh, immigrated first to the Ottoman uh, uh, region, which was then under Ottoman control. And later, after the First World War, under what then became known as the uh, Mandatory Palestine or the Palestinian Mandate, which was then under, under a colonial occupation. And um, subsequently, you basically formed, uh, find a situation that after Israel was bombed into existence, and I must put this point here, bombed into existence, it continued primarily to advocate on behalf of Israel that Zionism as, a, as an ideology continues to advocate on behalf of Israel and to obviously address the threats to its continued so-called uh, existence and its so-called right to self-defense, which you are hearing all the time. Now, I may add this point that when the partition took place, and you will probably know, the, the, the land that was apportioned to what was going to become Jewish land was, I think, something like um, 57%. And the Palestinian uh, control partition was about 42%. But, and so the, the argument that is generally put forth out there is that, well, Palestinians never accepted this. But the reality of the situation is that when Israel was um, eventually bombed into existence, it basically took something like 70%, 75% of the particular land. So it took more of the land than what was initially apportioned to it. The other argument, and we may you know, probably go into this in detail, hopefully the conversation goes forth, is that the argument that is presented out there that um, basically... Uh, Israel was a kind of a benign entity. These were benign uh, Jewish communities. And suddenly you had a situation where Arabs and the Arab armies invaded and attacked them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Because leading up to the, um, to, to the, to the existence of the state of Israel, which was bombed into existence, you had a series of massacres and terrorist attacks by Jewish terrorist outfits, which were euphemistically described as Jewish militia outfits. And you know the names like Irgun uh, and, and Stern, which were subcategories of the Haganah. And they were involved in some of the most horrendous, vicious 
brutal massacres that you could ever believe in. I mean, you know, you 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 look, at, I, you know, you can't even, we don't even have the time to go into the list of the massacres that basically took place. But there were, for example, the, 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 the famous massacre that people normally talk about, the Deir Yassin massacre, where you have a situation that um, Palestinian women were systematically gang raped by Jewish terrorist outfits. They were gang raped. Uh, you had, for example, um, a, a situation in terms of which they raped the women, they lined up the men, and they shot them dead in cold blood. Uh, and some of the individuals that were leading these outfits were individuals that became the founding fathers of Israel, like Menachem Begin and, and um, uh, uh, David Ben-Gurion. It's quite ironical that, um, you know, um, when, when Rishi Sunak, when, when he went, I think, to Israel just, uh, I think, a couple of months back, and we saw, I don't know if you, 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 you probably saw on the press or whether it was, in fact, shown in London, but we saw the images about him coming out of a uh, an aircraft and, in fact, giving um, the, uh, the, the um, Israeli ambassador to the UK with arms and ammunition. We saw this out there at the height of the genocide that was basically taking place. He, in fact, stayed, and I believe he stayed not too far away from the King David Hotel, which was subjected to bombing and destruction by these uh, Israeli terrorist death squads, where I think you had, um, uh, you had uh, for example, um, British uh, soldiers, uh, British military outfits that were massacred. And there's been no apology to date, no apology to date. And it's quite ironical that um, when the prime minister went there, and staying not too far, I believe, nearby the King David Hotel, that uh, there, there's not a, there's not a qualm, not a, not a whimper made about what had happened. So the reality of the situation that the formation of the State of Israel was bloody. This was uh, from from the early 1940s, um, uh, at least 1945, right up till 1947 when it was bombed into existence, and even before that, in the 30s, you had these sporadic killings that were being conducted by these Jewish terrorist squads, which people should know and which people should acknowledge and which people should realize was which laid the basis for the foundation of any hostility that may have existed that was basically um, um, that, uh, that may have manifested by the by the uh, Arab regimes um, that were around that particular area. So basically what had happened in 1948, then these, uh, Israel was bombed into existence. They created a massive refugee crisis. We know close to a million Palestinians were left and they became essentially refugees and they were never allowed to remain in that particular area. Those Palestinians that eventually stayed there, David Ben-Gurion, I think, um, um, made a statement that at a much later time in history that he wished he could have got rid of them as well. And then subsequently, what had happened after 1948, you had the Gaza Strip, which um, was under Egyptian uh, control. And then you had the West Bank, which was under Jordanian control. But come 1967, Israel then invaded those particular territories. Um, and um, subsequently, uh, up until the 80s, that's 88, um, Gaza was basically under, uh, still under occupation. In 1990, you had the Oslo Accords. And um, eventually, you had the so-called um, um, removal of these particular uh, Israeli armed officials in 2005, where the, the settlers were removed, where uh, there were, I may add, just simply superficial a superficial legislative election because because Hamas was not in control of anything, but the people um, basically voted for Hamas in light of the corruption that was existing in the Palestinian Authority, and people believed that the Palestinian Authority had sold out. And after Hamas had gone into legislative control, what then happened was that you had a total blockade, which totally devastated the Gaza economy and caused about approximately 50% of the poverty rate and probably one of the highest unemployment rates in the world. Now, we make this point before I end this particular portion that um, there were these rocket attacks. I may point this out that these rockets that were so-called, um, um, you know, flying into Israel from Hamas have no airheads. They've caused absolutely, I think, from 2006 to 
2023, uh, that's up until the 7th of October, up to, I think, about 39 casualties. And I may add that the rockets were only fired by Hamas after there was a raid by Israel in 2006 in the Gaza Strip, after Hamas had gone, Palestine had won the legislative election, and after there was an airstrike. And so then you had these rocket attacks which were fired by Hamas, and then it subsequently led to Operation Castle in 2009, and of course, Operation um, uh, Pull of Defense, I think, in 2014. So in 2009, 2012, 2014, and now, of course, 2019. And then you had the situation uh, in the uh, Sheikh Jarrah area, I think, in 2021, where Israeli settlers stormed and they removed Palestinians from this particular area. But the problem is, what has happened is that since 2006, right up until this particular point in time, Gaza has been under siege. And I've seen some of the comments uh, which are being made in some of the British media, um, like Talk TV and um, I think um, Sky News Australia, for that particular matter, that Gaza could be a potential Singapore. What absolute hogwash! What what rubbish! I mean, look at the look at the situation in Gaza. Prior to the seventh of October, ninety six percent of the water was undrinkable. Gazans in general had about four to five hours of electricity per day. They had 45% unemployment. You had 46% of the kids that suffer anemia. 50% of the children had depression. And 2 million of the, of the uh, people were denied the actual freedom to live. So when you have a situation that um, um, they claim that this could be potentially uh, Singapore, what the reality of the situation was that Israel supplied and they stopped and they started but they control the supply of water electricity fuel um and 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 in relation to the ports itself that's not under control of gazans at all so if you contrast that to for example a nation like singapore a nation like singapore with an extremely high uh, highly developed market economy most of the uh, GDP that has been generated or coming out of the uh, of Singapore is basically historically based on the extended uh, uh, trade at the ports, what they call the entroport uh, trade. So along with Hong Kong, South Korea, Taiwan, uh, the so-called four Asian tigers, the gross domestic product uh, since 1965, right up until now, has has averaged. Uh, you know, the, there's been growth rates average approximately 6% per annum. So it's absolute nonsense when you say that, look, we've left Gaza on its own. So Gaza, we, we are now living under a uh, perpetual threat. Instead of basically developing the economy, Hamas has basically engaged in building up these particular tunnels. The reality of the situation is Hamas is not, was not, and has never, ever been for the past decade and a half and any for an existential threat to Israel. Not at all. It has never been, with the exception of what happened on, on the 7th of October. And we'll, of course, explore the dynamics about what really happened. But Hamas has never been uh, a threat whatsoever to Israel. The reality of the situation, I mean, even the items of the goods, there's a policy which Israel has that it measures the number of people in Gaza. And it basically uh, mentions or it basically suggests that Gaza has to be uh, a portion that each individual has to be given a certain number of calories per day, which is beyond the basic minimum calories that you could have. So therefore, not surprisingly, a lot of commentators have described this as a as um, a, a mass open prison. But in reality, it's not a mass open prison because in a prison, you basically have food, you have water, you have the basic decent sanitation. These Gazans don't even have basic decent sanitation when 90% of the water is undrinkable. So how on earth could you call it a prison in the first place? It's an open concentration camp. A prison is not bombed. A prison is not sporadically having a situation where Israeli soldiers run in and rush in and perpetually go and shoot people randomly or engage in raids. The control is purely superficial from the perspective of Hamas and therefore not surprisingly, what you've got or what happened on the 7th of October is simply symptomatic 
of a far larger problem, which quite conveniently the mainstream media is um, is, is is hiding and of course not uh, basically showing. But I'm optimistic because I'm optimistic because for the first time ever, I see which you've never seen in the past and you could never see 20 years ago, where outfits like, for example, Sky News and um, BBC and CNN are asking questions that they would not ordinarily have asked. I mean, I see there was an interview uh, which was conducted, uh, I believe, on Sky News uh, by one of your journalists where he was questioning Mark Regev, or it was the other nutcase, Elon, uh, Elon Levi, on the issue of the of 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 the uh, shooting of the um, of sorry the the massacre at the Maghazi camp that just took place on on um, Christmas Eve, and I saw the questions that were asked, which was surprising to me because in the past mainstream journalists in the United Kingdom and in the U.S. would never ask these particular questions, albeit they are somewhat subdued. But the point is, these questions are now being asked, and I believe at some level. Israel is, in fact, losing the propaganda war. Social media and certainly podcasts like you brothers and and others out there are changing the game. You're changing what's happening. And the lies that we've been subjected to for a number of years, for decades, uh, rather, that's slowly being, uh, you know, waved away, it's been eked away. And so people are basically seeing that we are no longer being subjected to the kind of propagandists and lies. And we've got a new generation. The younger generation have access to social media. They've got access to TikTok in real time. And of course, you see these images before your eyes. You see images of beheaded babies, but they're not Israeli babies. They're Palestinian babies. You see images of burnt children and burnt people, but they're not burnt children or burnt people from the 7th of October. They are burnt Palestinians in real time before our eyes. So it becomes difficult. It becomes difficult for Israel or its propagandists out there to, in fact, construct an argument. And so it's just a kind of a threefold argument that they invent. They either say, number one, uh, that uh, they've got no choice by the, for the deaths because uh, these people are human shields, albeit the Palestinians, which is a racist analogy, that they are human shields. Or number two, that um, the what basically happened was essentially a mistake as they claimed in the Maghazi camp, uh, the refugee camp last week, where they claimed that the incorrect munitions were used. Well, what munitions were used, for example, at the Jabalia refugee camp when uh, close to 100 people were killed to target one Hamas person? Was it not a mistake then? Or alternatively, the third alternative is that they are saying that um, they, uh, they they are acting under self-defense. So the lies and the propagandist hogwash is falling away before our eyes. And um, nobody takes us seriously anymore. No decent person with common sense can basically take this seriously. And I think we need to be far more emboldened. I do understand that there are limitations and restrictions on the brothers in terms of uh, uh, movements like Hamas. But in South Africa, uh, you know, we basically, um, our South African government met with Hamas. We we met with the Hamas leadership uh, just a, a a couple of weeks back. So I understand that there's, a dilemma in terms of what people can say or cannot say in the United States, in Canada, in the United Kingdom. But at the very least, we need to conscientize people in terms of breaking the shackles of the propaganda that has been enclosing their eyes for a number of years. And I think I can see that that is happening slowly, albeit at a slow pace, but it's happening and people are no longer buying into this kind of propagandist lie and um, racist stereotypes that are before our eyes. Yeah, subhanAllah. That's very powerful, brother Yusuf. Uh, Mustafa, anything that you want to add or, or, or share? Yeah, I'd like to use him for a historical account of the events that have been leading up to what we have been witnessing over the last couple of months, um, tragic events which have unfolded. Uh, Mashallah, brother gave a thorough account, as I made mention, um, on the address the historical context and the setting which has which is often overlooked you see in, in this situation many people of the opinion that these events started on 7th of october by the um attack uh supposed attack by hamas on the um on the camp where the israeli um, idf i think were um, congregating but this has been shown to be a complete fallacy the historical context is absolutely prevalent 
and understanding the situation which has developed historically and the brutality in which this Zionist movement has neutralized and brutalized the uh, Palestinian people over a 75 year period. It's now coming to light. The great thing about these platforms that we particularly have, although they're not huge in number, it gives the people an opportunity to really reflect and understand the historical context of um, these events that have occurred. And we're now seeing, as Brother Yusuf has made mentioned, a new generation coming forward who are not prepared to tolerate the, uh, the tragedies of the past. And they really want to make a difference. And whilst we have these opportunities to learn the events that have occurred historically, it gives us the moral high ground, essentially, to really propagate the truthful reality of the brutal occupation of the Palestinian people over this 75 year period. So we've had um, a thorough account of that in, in a minute. I, I, I just want to, I want, I want to mention something else, Mustafa, just on that point is that um, the, you know, when, when I see Regev, Mark Regev, and he's been interviewed by Piers Morgan regularly, and, and I think it was Brother Hamza or somebody that described Piers as an algorithm prostitute, <laughs> uh, which in fact he is because of the fact that it's a kind of a clickbait for a lot of these mainstream media. But the one thing that comes out is the idea that is put forth that, that you know, and people, maybe people don't know, I don't know, you brothers would know, but people don't know that the, the argument is that the IDF is inherently a moral army. The IDF does not target civilians um, at all. The IDF, um, if, if civilians are, of course, killed, then this is probably, and they use the offensive term, collateral damage. But the one thing that should come out is that the IDF, or the forerunners to the IDF, is that the IDF per se, the Israeli Defense Force, which is a terrorist outfit, was formed on the basis of sanguinary mass murder and warfare. I mean, if you look at the these, uh, what they call the revisionist Zionist paramilitaries, the terrorist groups like Irgun, uh, Irgun, and um, the Stern Gang, uh, which which were which were the uh, I think subsidiaries of the Haganah Gang, because the Haganah also had other subsidiaries like the Palmach. If you look at these Jewish terrorist outfits that were the forerunners to the ad, because they basically became the IDF after 1948, the massacres that they committed started before the Second World War. So the general argument that is basically being presented is that Jews or the Jewish community were a very benevolent community, and they were subjected to persecution, which, of course, at one level, it is clear, not just Jews, but other groups like the Roma community, the Gypsies, the Polish, and very various other communities in Eastern Europe. But the idea is that this was a benevolent entity that was subjected to persecution, that was starving, and so they came as victims, as peaceful victims in this land, and then they were attacked by uh, the Arab armies, and then eventually you had this declaration in 48. But the reality is, if you look at the Jerusalem massacre, the Jerusalem massacre was committed by the Irgun terrorist Zionist entity. That was in 1937. That was before the Second World War, in fact, commenced. So my question is, what were these Jewish terrorist outfits doing in Jerusalem uh, uh, under Palestinian mandate, and, uh, under the British mandate in 1937, the Haifa massacre, where the paramilitaries from both Irgun and the Lehi Zionist groups, they, they bombed the entire market of Haifa. They killed, I think, about 20 Palestinians. Or the subsequent Jerusalem massacres and the subsequent Haifa massacres. I mean, these were repeated massacres in 1937, 1938, close to about 20 massacres where people were shot dead. Uh, these were civilians being killed. Hand grenades were thrown in at Palestinians at the vegetable market. The, the, these killings, these dead squads, were already in operation long before the Second World War had commenced. So this, this belies the whole notion that essentially Zionism was a peaceful project that just simply wanted to establish a homeland for Jews that were subjected to persecution. The Zionist terrorist outfits were already in progress in the 1930s, causing havoc and mayhem. And, um, and I mean, British soldiers, for example, British soldiers were killed. British uh, outfits were killed. Like, for example, I mentioned in the 40s at King David Hotel. So this is a lie that needs to be, uh, be, be broken. And also, I think the fact that even after 1948, you had, for example, um, 
there's one massacre which was i think just declassified uh, brother if you can go to your um email i think i may have emailed the what is called the 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 kafar kasam massacre that was a massacre that um that happened i think in 1956 and what happened with that particular massacre if we don't have it i'll just basically go through it what essentially happened was um that uh, the, the the Jews, the um, Israeli uh, civilian defense force, these particular individuals, they were given the free run to simply go and massacre the entire population. If you go on Google, just simply do a Google search and uh, you'll open up what, what is called the Kafir uh, Qasim Massacre. Um, and I'll just open it. You can do a Wikipedia search on it. Uh, it's basically, it took place in a village in Kafar Qasim. It was declassified, I think, in 2021, uh, where the massacre, were, there was a, a, a joint list in the, in the Neset to officially recognize that, that this was indeed a massacre. What had happened was that uh, Israeli border police, the, they came across these Arab civilians that were returning from work during a curfew, they were unaware of this particular curfew. That curfew had been imposed, uh, you know, prior to the 1956 war on the eve of the Sinai War. And in total, you had a situation of 48 people were shot dead in cold blood. 19 were men, 6 were women, 23 were children aged 8 to 17. And the Arab sources, on the other hand, give this figure as up to as high as 50. This was in cold blood, shot dead in cold blood. There was no Hamas there. There was no Islamic Jihad. There was no popular front for the liberation of Palestine. The border police who were involved in the shooting, they were eventually brought to trial. But they found, they found, the Israeli court that found that they were basically operating under command responsibility. In other words, they were given the direct order by the highest ranking officials to commit these particular massacres. So that's one out of a number of massacres. There's been so many massacres that have happened from 1948 onwards that people have even lost count in relation to what has basically happened. And people assume, therefore, that whenever Israel bombs and whenever Israel uh, kills civilians, this is uh, out of necessity. This is collateral damage. Israel doesn't really mean this. But the reality of the situation is that Israel has had a history. It's got a precedent of doing it before the formation of the state of Israel, during the formation of Israel when it was bombed into existence in 48, and from 1948 up until this present date, where they are killed deliberately, with deliberate intent. So it's the biggest lie that we are essentially seeing. Um, it, it's only in 2007, I may add, that um, in relation to the massacre at uh, Kafar Qasim, where Shimon Peres formally apologized for the particular massacre which was a, a, an anathema. It was basically, a, 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 it's something that is unheard of because Israel never apologizes for any of its massacres. So Israel is a state that was created on the basis of an ideological premise in terms of promoting itself through genocide. It was bombed into existence through genocide and, and ethnic cleansing. It sustained itself for the past 75 years through genocide and ethnic cleansing. And what is engaged now is just simply taking it on a new level of ethnic cleansing and genocide. And October 7th was the, the so-called uh, you know, weapon of mass destruction, so-called weapon of mass destruction, like you had uh, the UK and the US government having the weapon of mass destruction in Iraq as a kind of a pretext to destroy and, 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 and butcher the Iraqis. So Israel basically needed something for what it always intended to do. And October 7th was a convenient excuse, uh, allowing it to engage in its kind of sanguinary mass insanity that you see before our very eyes. And I think we should not keep quiet about this. We should drum it all the time. Because every time I see some of our good Muslim brothers in the media, they're on the back foot. What happened on October 7th? Do you condemn Hamas? What about the Hamas charter? Well, let's look at the Hamas charter. Let's read it. Let's go and see what they actually mean and what they say. And so we need to basically make this discourse available in the public eye and, of course, um, shame them for the fact that they do not have the decency or they have got no moral qualms in terms of questioning us when they themselves are justifying and sustaining a genocidal state. That's amazing. Well, Lai, it's, it's, it's really profound the way you, you, you gave out the information. I've got a very uh, sensitive or, or, or controversial question. Uh, when these so-called uh, 
Israeli uh, politicians or, or leaders, uh, do they uh, feel that they are religiously uh, bound to kind of like uh, get rid of the Palestinians and, and take over that land? Land, or are they yeah. using it? Or they using uh, monetary uh, or financial gains? Uh, which one is it? You, you know, you know, it's quite strange that a lot of these Israelis themselves, these Israeli leaders, the members of the parliament. I mean, there's different factions. For example, um, there's an interesting book. I don't know. If, I'll probably kind of send the email. It's written by a local South African called Why Israel: The Anatomy of a Zionist uh, Apartheid, a South African Perspective, and he goes into details with the different parties that um, make up the particular Knesset. And by and large, what he argues in this particular book in relation to the political setup in Israel and the, the, the political, um, the, the kind of ideological leanings of a lot of these politicians themselves, a lot of them are secular. There are very few that are basically, for example, he gives you a, a list of parties. Um, and of course, a lot of these parties, for example, like the, he gives you a summary of the primary uh, political parties in Israel. And, you know, you've got the Kadima, the Likud party, the Labour party, the uh, Yisrael Baitenu, the Shas party, the Maftal party. The only party that is kind of religiously minded, which you probably know, is the Shas party, because that's the ultra-Orthodox uh, Sephardic party. And one of the famous leaders was uh, Rabbi Ovedia Yusuf. Uh, if you look at the other parties, for example, like um, Labour party, which has been traditionally leftist, although equally genocidal, in 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 um, in its um, in its basic um, the way it postulates itself, the way it has perpetuated itself over the years. If you look at some of the people under Likud, people like Ben Gurion and Golda Meir, and uh, you know uh, Yitzhak Rabin, Moshe Dayan, these are not individuals that were peace-loving individuals, but they were secular nonetheless. And then of course you've got the Likud party, which is the Menachem Begin, Shamir Netanyahu, um, and then Kadima, which is Sharon. From what I can gather, a lot of these individuals are not religiously minded. They are secular. But when it suits them, and when it's convenient for them, they make the argument that um, that justifies the existence based on religious grounds. I mean, Theodor Hadzel himself and a lot of the individuals that were part and partal, parcel of the early Zionist classical movement were by no means religious. Uh, uh, Shime Weissman, for example, none of these individuals. And by the way... Um, you know, the, the late um, scholar, um, uh, the, the brilliant scholar, Muhammad Assad, when he was, um, I may just share this, uh, when, when he was a, a, a correspondent for the uh, Austrian-German newspaper, the Frankfurter Zeitung, he in fact narrates in his book, I believe it's either The Road to Mecca or Islam at the Crossroads, that he was at one of these meetings, he was actually covering one of the meetings, uh, Muhammad Assad, by the way, is, uh, Leopold Weiss is Muhammad Assad, the famous translator of the one of the best Qurans in the 20th century, the translation. But he was at this particular meeting and he was with Weissman and he was with a lot of these Zionist leaders in the early 1920s. And he makes a point that none of them were particularly religiously minded. They were by no means ultra orthodox in that sense. But conveniently, they used religion as a basis for justifying the particular uh, existence of the state of Israel. And of course, I mean, they appeal to the whole ancient argument that, um, um, uh, you know, Israel basically was um, belonging to the Jews. Israel, in fact, was uh, something which um, was um, controlled by them at some particular point in ancient history. And, um, and so from that particular perspective, they've got some sort of allegiance to the state of Israel. And so this is their homeland. But the reality of the situation, which people also don't know, is that um, Palestine has never been under Jewish autonomy, at least up till from 1948. From 1948, it had never been under Jewish autonomy for close to 4,000 years. What I mean by that, in, 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 you know, if you look at the, 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 the periods that existed in ancient history, for example, even from the time of David, if and archaeologically we can prove it, but from 1000 BC, from about 1000 BC, approximately, um, it was under Persian rule, I think, uh, from about 538 to, three, uh, to, to 300 BC. It was then under Hellenistic rule, uh, you know, from 300 BC onwards. Subsequently, 
in 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 the period um, uh, of 100 BC onwards, going downwards, it becomes under Roman rule. You had the early Roman period, the late Roman period. You then had the Byzantine period, and then in the sixth or seventh century, you have the Arabs. So Jews had never been under the Israel had or Palestine had never been under Jewish autonomy for at least close to three to four thousand years, at the very least. And those Jews who basically came or, um, you know, claimed the so-called autonomy uh, of this particular land based on the so-called um, allusion to the idea of the ancient Israelites being under occupation at some particular point in time and being under so-called political and religious control. If we were to grant that for the sake of argument, the Jews who basically make that particular claim have no linguistic They've got no genetic, nor they have, nor do they have any kind of religious link or affiliation with the ancient Israelites. I mean, most of the Jews, I believe it was Shlomo Sand in his book, the invention, or the the invention of the Jewish people, and of course, I think it was the same point was made by um, Arthur Kusler in his book, the Thirteenth Tribe, that a lot of the Jews from Europe, from Eastern Europe, um, from Central Europe come from, uh, you know, they were actually descendants of Jews who had apparently converted to Judaism in the 7th or 8th century, and they come from Eastern Europe. That's why they they, they call them the, the kind of Ashkenazi Jews, the Ashkenazi. That's a kind of a term that was used to define a, a, um, a distinct kind of, um, um, uh, you know, uh, cultural group of Jews who settled in the 10th century in Western Germany. They were converts to Judaism. They were not indigenous to Judaism. Jews who were uh, indigenous to um, the Palestinian area or the area which is now Israel lived side by side with the, with the Palestinians for thousands of years under Ottoman uh, control and before that under the time of the Abbasids and the Umayyad period. So they've got no linguistic claims. So coming to your initial question, I know we've gone a, in, a, in a roundabout way a lot of these politicians are by no means religiously minded. They're not religiously minded at any level whatsoever, but they use religion as a basis for justifying their uh, particular mass um, uh, actions of, of genocide and, and, and genocide. And I may, may make one, one, this one particular point. The one thing that, that comes out all, all the time is that... Um, you know, doesn't Israel have the right to defend itself? And these people are under siege. They being killed. Don't they have the right to defend themselves? But it's quite amazing that whilst the mainstream media are making this particular point, the very leaders, the very leaders in the Knesset, who are basically in control of Israel, who are by no means religious, are not actually raising self-defense. So, for example, when Netanyahu says, we will turn Gaza into an island of ruins. And he invokes the Amalekite massacre in accordance with 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse 3. He's not speaking at a, as a religious Jew, although he claimed to be religious. He's secular, but he invokes that as a basis for justi justifying genocide. When the Israeli extremist, former Prime Minister uh, Naftali Bennett, speaks about killing of Palestinians and Gazans because they're animals, and he made it clear when... when um, Yoav Gallant stated that there will be no food, no water, no electricity because we are dealing with human animals and cockroaches. And they use language that is being used, that was uh, used basically in the Rwandan genocide. We clearly know that on the one hand, they're using religion as a basis for political expediency, particularly when Netanyahu invokes the Amalekite massacre. And number two, they give the intent to commit war crimes and genocide and destruction and massacre. So when Piers Morgan hypocritically states that, look, I only concern myself, I've got a moral quandary here about the fact that um, what is the proportionality of Israel's right to self-defense? There's no proportionality. They're not talking about proportionality. When, 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 um, when uh, one of the um, uh, reservists the, or the, the Minister of Finance, Smotrich, who tells Israeli Arabs that the only reason that they are here is because Israel did not finish the job in 1948. They give the intent to commit war crimes and genocide and destruction and massacre, like the minister who spoke about nuking Gaza. Or, you know, they, they, so, so the point is, how many Palestinian babies 
need to be slaughtered, need to be, how many families need to be incinerated due to Israel's carpet bombing for it to be contingent to Israel's so-called hypocritical claim to self-defense. It doesn't make sense whatsoever. So they use religion when it suits them. And of course, when it's expedient, they claim land. Um, but in, in reality, you know, in, in, most of them are not basically um, a Jewish from a religious point of view. I mean, you know, you, 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 took a, you look at the, the social element in Israel, the largest gay pride parade festival, openly allowed. I, I believe, subject to correction, it is in Israel. If you look at, for example, a lot of these practices that are committed by Israel, I mean, they're not religiously minded. But when it comes to land, when it comes to property, when it comes to control, they use religion for, as a basis for political expediency. So that would be my take and response to your question, Brother Muhammad, on that particular issue. And it's quite clear that these people are out on their insane quest for total destruction and they want the land of Gaza for their own for their own claim. Yeah, it's it's very interesting, Brother Yusuf. Uh, I think social media plays a huge part in this uh, this war or this conflict that's taking place right now. Uh, initially, uh, on the 7th of October, uh, Hamas was blamed for beheading babies and raping and, 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 and whatnot. And then it turned out, then it kind of turned out throughout eyewitnesses that a lot of the killing was done by the IDF, the helicopters that were used. They actually killed more civilians, Israelis, than Hamas or, you know, the attack that actually took place. How do you feel? Uh, you meant you touched on it slightly regarding the media and how much the media has kind of swayed towards uh, empathy and sympathizing to, from the, the Palestinian side. This, this rule of not taking hostages and the killing of Israelis at the so called party, how do you feel right now that the media has kind of like sometimes sweeps? Uh, information underneath the carpet and do you feel right now that the story or the narrative is being delivered uh, equally now that the attack that we saw the images of the road and you saw cars burnt out and and from basic information and knowledge you can tell that is done by military you know helicopters or aircraft being used to uh, attack and even kill hostages. Uh, what is your understanding of this type of rule that the Israelis use and the IDF rules that, you know, no hostages are allowed to be taken? There is a yeah. terminology for that. Yeah, there, there is a terminology. It's called, it's called the, um, what's it called? Um, it's a terminology where hostages are basically killed. It just slips my mind, but I'll come to it closely. Hannibal, I'll come to Hannibal, it shortly. Hannibal, Hannibal, Hannibal. Hannibal. Some doctrine. The, the Hannibal Doctrine, the Hannibal Doctrine, yeah, the, the Hannibal Doctrine was actually used. It's a, it, they, they claim it was basically done away with, and it basically applies to um, um, what they call um, Israeli military officials. The, 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 the thrust of the Hannibal Doctrine is the following, is that if, for example, um, you, you see it's a directive, it was a, it's a procedure that and they claim that they've done away with it. What normally happens is that where there's a kidnapping, where there's a kidnapping of, say, a military official, a military or a soldier for that particular matter, then that kidnapping must be stopped at all means, even if it means that you strike and you harm the person or you kill the person with your own force. I think this doctrine first came out in the, in the 80s. I think it was the mid-80s. Because what had happened then, if you look at 82 before that, there was the, the, the Lebanon, the invasion of Lebanon in 82, where, again, Israel committed massacres of untold proportions. And you are probably familiar with the Sabran Shatila massacres um, of where in one, I think in a, a period of two days, close to 3,000 Palestinians were butchered and killed by phalanges. And this was overseen by the, the Israeli Defense Force that had secured the area and allowed these uh, Lebanese phalanges and these Christian phalanges to just simply massacre these uh, Palestinians. But what had happened was in 86, there were a number of abductions by IDF um, of soldiers in Lebanon, and there were the so-called um, 
um, you know, these so-called prison exchanges in terms of which we get your soldiers and then we bargain and, and negotiate. Um, and I think it had to do with, um, I believe, the forces that were fighting the Israelis back then. Uh, I think it was Hezbollah. What then happened is that they introduced this directive and this directive stated, the Hannibal Directive, that um, if you can't stop this kidnapping because it will put you in a state of um, disadvantage, then you ensure that the kidnapper and the person who is kidnapped must be killed. So this basic process has gone on for from time immemorial from them, from, from that particular period. They claimed that the IDF chief of staff in 2016 had apparently uh, revoked it. And um, th this was basically, I think in, in, it was in relation to the, the chap that was kidnapped, the uh, individual, what's his name, Gilad Shilat, I think sometime around 2016. And then they claimed that um, this directive had been done away with. But it's quite clear that if you look at the facts on the particular ground, that happened on the 7th of October, what we see out playing in real time appears to be something like the Hannibal Directive. Because a number of, of people that were kidnapped on that day or taken as hostages were members of the Israeli Defense Force together with Israeli civilians. So it's not untoward to believe that Israel, that this is a so-called unique situation, and that Israel would have particularly invoked this specific doctrine in order to prevent the idea that hostages are taken and then it puts Israel on a back foot in terms of which it would be forced to now negotiate about the thousands of Palestinians that are kept under illegal administrative detention on the West Bank and certainly uh, languishing in the torture cells of Israel. So what initially happened on the 7th of October, we were told that 2,000 people were killed. This was the figures that we were at least hearing in South Africa, at least on the news that we were getting on Associated Press and Reuters. The figures were then basically reduced after about, I think, a week to 1,200. And then that was being trumped out that, look, 1,400 people were being killed over and above the number of civilians that were taken in captivity. And then we were also told about the fact that babies were beheaded, 40 beheaded babies, and that women were basically raped, and that um, women were sexually violated. All of that could be traced to one particular uh, journalist. And in fact, at that time, in fact, I think CNN, or it was captured on news, that CNN officials were even told, the, the CNN um, journalists were told to simulate, for example, that they're being attacked by Hamas and by Israel at the early stages of this particular conflict. We then got to realize that the beheaded babies story was totally fabricated. Joe Biden, who initially parroted this rubbish, had to do a about turn because there was no eyewitness testimony for that. And further, there was no eyewitness testimony, and there has never been an eyewitness testimony of rape that took place up to this day. Nobody has come out. Those uh, hostages or those civilians that were released by Hamas, in fact, give a far, a very positive account on their treatment by Hamas when they were kept in custody. In fact, they mentioned the elderly lady, I think the 87-year-old lady stated that she was under fear of the Israeli bombings of Gaza at that particular point in time. Because Israel's bombing, we can make the argument whether it's indiscriminate or discriminate, but they were in fear of the fact that they would be killed, these hostages, which just goes to show that Israel cares and dilly squat about these hostages. But be that as it may, the so-called mass rape was, was done away with. Um, the electronic intifada, for example, um, goes into a, a lengthy detail um, in terms of how this particular uh, story is garbage and that the, the actual crime that, that is alleged to have stated to have occurred never took place. Eventually, once all this garbage was put aside, and by the, by the time that, um, that people realized that this was false and this information was correct, there were no beheaded babies, no beheaded children, we haven't even seen a single image of a beheaded person. I've seen clips of the 43 minutes. There were no beheaded babies or raped children. But once that was already debunked, Israel had already began its insane attack on Gaza. And um, I think we had, at that stage, close to 5,000 people had already been killed and been murdered. 
eventually, eventually, in November 2023, MSNBC, uh, which was led by the excellent journalist Mahdi Hassan, I believe he was removed after the show. I'm not so sure if he's back again doing his program. But he challenged the Israeli spokesperson, this propagandist that I've spoken about, Mark Regev, about the many lies and the claims that Israel had made to justify genocidal bombing. And when he was uh, attempting to respond to that particular question, he was trying to shift and change and change the narrative. Eventually, he made one admission. And, he, and his admission was this. He stated that originally they made the claim that Hamas had come in and burnt everybody. And so they had given the casualty figure to 1,400, including the bodies that were burnt allegedly by Hamas. He made the admission on television that out of the 1,400 casualties, Israel has now officially reduced the figure to 1,200 because they claim that they've overestimated and made the mistake. And they are not, he made the claim. This, is, this can be seen if you open up the, uh, the click, the, the link that I've sent to the brother from the electronic intifada. You can see the video. He makes the point that the bodies that they thought that they were burnt were actually Hamas terrorists. This is his own words. They were burnt and they were burned by Hamas terrorists. And it actually, we had burnt them. In other words, this is exactly what he says. So if he burned them, and you see pictures of burning and the houses being burnt. And there was an entire convoy of motor vehicles that were totally burnt out and destroyed. And they looked like they had been struck. It's quite clear that who burned them? Who burned them? It's quite clear that Israel burned them. And now we are told that Israeli Apache helicopters basically came in and attacked and uh, uh, attacked Hamas. But in the process of burning Hamas, what they failed to realize that there were other bomb burned bodies there. And those burned bodies were in all likelihood burned by Israel. This is confirmed by Mark Regev in his interview with Mahdi Hassan. And so he's caught out on that particular point because the burned bodies were always used as an excuse to commit the genocide in Gaza. Uh, you know, um, uh, and, 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 and they were basically pointed out, in fact, this, this um, one of your own guys, um, what's his name? Um, from the Henry Jackson Society, um, Douglas Murray. Douglas Murray, he 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 went on uh, at the initial stages, and uh, he sent he sent in as an embedded journalist to Tel Aviv, and I see him sitting in Tel Aviv, and he claims to be in a war zone like a hypocrite. That he's seen these burned bodies, he's seen all these burned bodies in the hospitals. He's witnessed the burned bodies, and it is atrocious. Which burned bodies did he see? When Mark Regev, who is the propagandist for Israel, conceded on live television on MSNBC that the burned bodies were Hamas burned bodies. And he says that they made a mistake. But if they are burned Hamas bodies, what about the other burned houses? What about the burned cars? What about the civilians that were, who burned them? Now Israel hasn't mentioned anything along that line. So as it stands right now, the figures, the actual figures are something like 1,139 in total. Out of the 1,139, approximately 420 were... Uh, apparently Israeli soldiers. And um, even though uh, it claimed that it had direct evidence, if you look at the 43-minute video that they showed a selected group of audience, I don't know if you've seen those 43 minutes, I think it could be downloaded from the dark web. But there's no, there's no image of Hamas burning anyone, nothing at all. There's no image of Hamas beheading anybody, no image of Hamas beheading babies, no image of Hamas raping anyone. Yes, you do see people getting killed and people being taken away. But Israel, up to this date, has never been able to explain how on earth these fighters, if it was Hamas as they initially did, could cause such an enormous amount of damage to the Israeli houses if they only had light weapons that they were seen carrying. Because they came in these hang gliders. And uh, obviously... Uh, you know, the, the Hamas fires, uh, the, 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 the Hamas organization, the, the, the members, they didn't set themselves on fire. And Israel obviously got to know the circumstances in terms of which these people died. So if they died by virtue of the fact that they were blown up um, by the Israeli Apache helicopter gunships, then that's a significant addition to the mounting evidence that Israeli forces actually went on this panicked rampage and they started firing wildly 
with their powerful weapons. And they killed both Palestinian fighters and indeed the Israeli um, civilians that were there. If you look at the testimonies of the survivors at the kibbutz, there was a lady, Yasmin, I think Yasmin Porat. She mentioned that she saw the helicopters which had these large amounts of these cannon shells and these uh, the, these hellfire missiles, and the and the and the pilots weren't able to uh, make the distinction between the Palestinians uh, and the Israeli civilians at all. They couldn't make the distinction who's a soldier, who's a civilian. So as when we hear reports of one of the squadron leaders telling the people that look, shoot everything, they basically shoot at everything. <laughs> so this idea. Um, uh, uh, of, of, of the civilian death toll being so high because Hamas is using civilians as human shields or that they use uh, uh, they, they use them in the in, in on the 7th of October it's it's debunked by their own official narrative that is coming out so the question at the end of the day is who benefits the other point is which I've also sent you the article uh, on the New York Times report we are given to understand that um as early as a year before the incident, Israel apparently had the full details about what transpired on the seventh of October in terms of in terms of the of the um, the plan which they called Operation Jericho. If you again check the New York Times, the New York Times was the first article um, to basically blow this up into um, full um, um, exposure. In terms of what transpired, and then of course, Electronic Intifada um, uh, recovered that particular article. But they basically made the point that Israel knew in advance a year ago what basically happened, or what was going to happen, or what the plan um, was going to basically uh, take place on that particular day to the letter. Now, the point is that it's quite clearly that they would have got this specific information via um, uh, some form of intelligence in terms of what transpired, or somebody would have informed them. But it's quite clear that um, th they knew the information, they knew the end game, and they did nothing about it. So was this possibly a false flag operation? Was this something that Israel needed? Because it provided a convenient excuse for Israel to engage in its particular acts of uh, sanguinary warfare and mass genocide. And... Um, the, 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 the point people basically are asking is that, is it possible that this could have been a false flag operation? Would would they have done this? Because, I mean, there's other false flag operations that have happened in the past, like the Lavon affair. Check up what the Lavon affair is uh, in relation to that. Check up what happened prior to the incident. Check up why is it that at, at, the, at the given moment when you can't come to the fence in entering Israel. How is it that on that particular day, all these fighters were managed to get inside Israel? What happened? Where, wh how, how did the Israeli soldiers stand down? So all these questions are not being asked, are not being looked at. And so the, mm. the uh, general propaganda is what happened on October 7th. I'm mm. also saying, let's not even go back, because a lot of our Muslim brothers, and I see some of the interviews, when they questioned about October 7th, they say, well, we need to go back to the history, 75 years. And sometimes you lose by default because why go back 75 years? Why not just go back two days before October 7th? Two days before October 7th, Israel launched a pogrom, a massacre in the Huara village in West Bank, where they killed six Palestinians. Prior to that, um, uh, this year alone, hundreds of settlers invaded Al-Aqsa Mosque. All those actions are illegal under international law. In this year alone, 2023, look at the count in terms of how many Palestinians were killed before the October 7th. This year alone, between 2022 to 2023, how many Palestinians were killed, either by raids, either being killed on the West Bank by the Israeli settlers and the Israeli Defense Force? How many Palestinians were killed? More than 200, close to 300. Look at the figures. So look at what happened over the past two years before October 7th. And then you juxtapose it with what happened to October 7th. October 7th, which they are putting forth as the total, uh, the, the worst uh, massacre that has ever been committed since the Second World War as a result of the Nazi uh, Germany's Holocaust. That's now basically blown up into smithereens. But it's too late. It's too late because they've already massacred 21,000. It was convenient for them to 
engage in what they did, and they needed the, they needed the beheaded babies, they needed the burnt Israeli civilians, they needed the rape, because that would create the sympathy, it would garner global support, and that would give them an ideal leverage, and indeed a convenient weapon of mass distraction to commit its, its uh, atrocious conduct in terms of what is going on at this particular juncture. You know, what I find quite disturbing is that, unfortunately, to the Western media and to the media overall, that numbers, it's just numbers. You know, uh, when people, yeah. uh, Palestinians, are, are being killed and massacred, it's a number. It's it's no name, no person, you know, personal yeah. information is shared about the, you know, individual. And one thing I, I realised, especially when you mentioned, uh, like, Talk TV and Piers Morgan, that they, every time they use the the term Hamas, bar barbaric. It's barbaric. Yeah. So they're trying yeah. to uh, label the, the, the Muslims who are trying to defend themselves as barbaric individuals. And and people fall for that terminology because it's a mindset. As soon as you mention Hamas, it's it's barbaric or barbaric. You know, and, I, I, mean, and, I made one point, well, one point, Brother Mohammed, you know, about the, the, the numbers and the figures. It's quite strange that you made the point. Gideon Levi, who is the journalist for Haaretz, when he was interviewed by Sky News, he made the point that Israeli civilians, if they were to see, if they were to see, because they are getting numbers and they're getting statistics, but if they were to see on their national television what a lot of us in the West are seeing in South Africa, in the UK, I mean, they've got no access to Al Jazeera, that's shut down, so that's totally out of the question. But if they were to see what Israel is doing now, they would basically take up against Islam. I mean, already you've got a dissatisfaction amongst these uh, these um, individual civilians who've had their families taken as hostages. They've protested directly against Netanyahu. And one of the points they're making is that if you are so concerned about the, um, the, 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 the lives of the hostages, how do you justify the indiscriminate or could we rather say targeted bombings where you don't know where the civilian hostages are kept your own hostages, you don't know, and um, you don't really care. I mean, this is this was born out just uh, three weeks ago when the um, those three men, they were in their undergarments, they took off their shirts, they walked with a white flag, and they spoke in Hebrew, and Israel shot them dead. What was the response? Oh, it was a mistake. So they're running out of excuses. <laughs> it was a mistake. But the mistake that they made was that they possibly, if there was a mistake, which I doubt, but if they believed it was really a mistake, the only mistake could have been that they assumed that these were Palestinians. Because if these were Palestinians and it's realized that these were Palestinians, they would not they, they would basically say they were being attacked. And these were Hamas militants that had been attacked, and so they shot them. Like they've done at the school. You know, I, I don't I don't know if you should show it. It's not advisable to show it. But when I showed it on my YouTube channel, um, the killing at the Abu Ghazala school, where you have pictures on Al Jazeera shown live pictures of actual dead bodies lying, strewn around lying. And eyewitness testimonies that are saying there was no bombing or striking of the school. These are children and people and civilians that were taking refuge in the school being shot dead, shot dead in cold blood. And you can see the eyewitness testimony and you can see the dead bodies. They're not burnt as a result of a strike. These were shot dead. So Israel is now engaging in systematically targeted shooting and murder of Palestinians. These are death squads. I mean, like the situation where they they um, they they, they um, bulldozed the dead bodies that were killed, or they are basically un uh, destroying the um, the graveyards. You know, we just see these reports daily. Why do you destroy a graveyard? Why do you why do you uproot the entire graveyard? Are the Hamas tunnels there? So the lies are being broken down by the minute. It's becoming so disingenuous that. Um, that, that, that basically that, that there's, there's no justification and the people are being brainwashed. I mean, I don't know if the brother can play this um, video clip which I've sent of the Israeli children singing. Have you seen that um, song which was produced by the Rosenbaum Communication? Have you, brother, seen that particular song? Yeah, we, ha we have seen it, uh, yeah. unfortunately. So it may not be necessary to um, play that, but here mm. you have a, a, a situation where children are basically uh, egging on the Israeli Defense Force to totally destroy Gaza, and they use the term destroy to oblivion. 
in a year, there will be no one there and we will be able to return to our fields and plow our fields. Your fields in Gaza, what are you talking about? So this is a problem that you've got before you. And and unfortunately, the um, the a lot of the discussions that I've seen in the mainstream media, I mean, sometimes, and I mean, the brothers are excellent, they're articulate, but unfortunately, a lot of the discussion, a, a lengthy portion of the discussions that you see, the presenters take you back to October 7th. And then you have to go through an, a lengthy uh, um, you know, discussion and, and you witness an obfuscation in terms of what is going on before your very eyes, in terms of what is transpiring, what is happening. And um, therefore, the, the agenda is to take you away. It's to take you away from actually what's transpiring. So October 7th is a convenient um, excuse in relation to that. And we, we know the fact that um, Hamas is just simply the smokescreen. That's a smokescreen. So when they ask you about the Hamas charter, most of them don't know what it contains. They don't know what it contains. Uh, but that's basically thrown before our very eyes. It's that, you know what that's where I was going through going to ask you next regarding yeah. the charter. Every yeah. time you have these so-called uh, shows, you know, Piers Morgan and other individuals who are paid by media organisations who are uh, somehow connected and linked to this type of Zionism, uh, you know, uh, thought process. They always uh, first question, of course, brother Yusuf yeah. uh, is asked, "Do you condemn Hamas?" Okay. Let's get that cleared first. Then it's the charter. The charter yeah. clearly says that we need to wipe out the Jewish state, this yeah. land. Please give the audience yeah. some understanding regarding this. And also I want to touch on the Hasbara, uh, yeah. Israeli propaganda machine, yeah. if you don't yeah. mind sharing your thoughts sure, on that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I think that's one point. Firstly, Hamas, prior to its formation in 87, was a a movement that was a benevolent movement and um, that was basically involved in charity Sheikh Ahmed Yassin. I saw a discussion some years back by Mahdi Hassan, which was apparently refuted by Dr. Azam Tamimi, where Mahdi Hassan stated that um, Hamas was in fact created or funded at its earlier stages by Israeli intelligence as a kind of a bulwark to the far more militant back then Palestinian, uh, the, the Fatah or the Palestinian Liberation Organization as it was known because both the PLO and the other movements like the um, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine which is run by George Habash or back then was run by George Habash that was a Marxist organization Islamic Jihad never existed and there was no uh, Islamic movement as such that was basically engaged in any kind of resistance so the talk is, and again, this has been questioned, I don't know how people view it, that apparently Israel wanted a kind of a more uh, nuanced religious kind of um, alternative to Fatah, which would be less uh, inclined to engage in any kind of resistance. I mean, and the argument that is put forth is a kind of same, similar kind of argument that is made in the kind of the Afghan context, where they basically put the argument that the Mujahideen were our Mujahideen, the Taliban and the forerunners uh, to them in the 80s, who were basically backed and funded by the CIA and the by the Pakistani Inter-Services Intelligence and so on. So the same kind of argument is made in relation to Hamas. Um, and I've seen this by some journalists. I believe there's a book I have here. Um, I think this book here, yeah, Jeremy Scarhill. I think get this book here if I've got it here. Jeremy Scarhill has is, is got a book called uh, British, British Writer, uh, Dirty Wars, The World is a Battlefield. And I think the same kind of argument is put forth. But a lot of other scholars like Dr. Azam Tamimi states that that is not correct, that Hamas, in fact, grew as a legitimate alternative Islamic resistance to what they saw was uh, oppression during the uh, First Intifada. And uh, so I don't want to get involved in that particular debate. But now it comes to the issue about the Hamas Charter. Firstly, the one point that needs to be noted about this is that the Hamas Charter, the original Hamas Charter, if you can, those who access it and can in fact read it in Arabic, it's not on, it's not part, if you look at the official uh, constitution and in fact um, the official documentation of Hamas as it stands today, the original Hamas Charter of 87 doesn't, doesn't play any part of it. Two of the Hamas leaders, um, one was uh, the well-known individual called Khalid Mishal. The other one was um, 
Abu Musa Mazruk made the point that when it was drafted, it was drafted in haste. So there is no talk about any kind of extermination of Jews as such. And they make the point, Hamas makes the point in relation to the chart of 87, that when there's any kind of reference to Zionists or the Zionist state, the word that they use in Arabic is Yahud, Yahudi or Yahud. Now, in the absence, and, and this is again subject to correction and my ignorance, but in the absence of a terminology or a term for Zionist in the classical sense, in the Arabic parlance for Zionist, they use the term Yahud. But Yahud in the context of not Jews in general, but Jews specifically with an ideological bent towards uh, Zionism and indeed sustaining the state of Israel through its oppression and its sanguinary warfare against Israel. So that's the first point that they make, that the reference to Yahud in the original Hamas charter is in reference to the Zionists. The second point is this, is that the only reference to extermination, if at all, and in relation to Israel, which which is not, in, there is no direct imperative, but there is a mention, which we're all familiar with, about the Hadith of the end times, this kind of eschatological reference in terms of which where come the end times, um, even the stones and the trees will, in a manner of speaking, make mention of the fact that um, there is a Jew behind me. Get him, get him. So when they talk about extermination, they use and they refer to this particular reference in the original Hamas charter, which is in fact Hadith. Now, of course, and um, you know, I know Brother Nazam and I, I don't know if he's li listening to this, uh, podcast uh, is well aware that there are different categories of hadith but be that as it may whether it's authentic or not non-authentic the point being made is that that hadith on its own is a hadith which details the end times something which is eschatological something which is not a direct imperative to kill and one may add this other point as well that you find the same thing the same thing about extermination of jews in Christianity, and uh, when I tell some of my Christian brethren, I was having a chat with a Christian pastor the other day, I said that this kind of so-called hadith, which is contained in the Hamas charter, which you people basically have so much of an issue with, well, you find something similar to that in the end times in your own biblical tradition. I mean, if you look, for example, in the New Testament, in the uh, book of Revelation, when Jesus comes in the end time, and he will come with a rod of iron, and uh, in fact, if I, if I may just basically get the reference uh, to in relation to, to uh, what, what Jesus will basically do, is that he will basically come, um, uh, you know, I saw heaven opened, uh, he's, he's clothed, that Jesus was a vesture dipped in blood, his name is called the word of God, Jesus, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of the almighty God and the remnant was slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse which sword proceeded out of his mouth and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. Now if you get a concordance, if you get a Bible concordance to the book of Revelation and all those passages about Jesus killing and Jesus slain you get a cross reference which takes you back to the gospel of Luke chapter 19 verse 27 where Jesus says of those enemies of mine who would not let me reign over them, bring them here and slay them before me as a kind of a metaphorical allusion to the end times. Now who were his enemies? The enemies were his immediate contemporaries, the Israelites, the Jews. He was referencing the Jews. So when he comes with the exception of the 144,000, he will be slaying all his enemies all the Jews, they will be all put to the sword and they will be slaughtered and they will be massacred. So similar to that, you've got something analogous to that in the Hadith corpus, which gives this idea, and I don't have the Hadith in front of me, that in the end times, even the stones and the trees will be making the so-called proclamation that there is a Jew behind me, uh, get him, get him. So that's what's basically contained in that original Hamas charter. And so when 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 there is a criticism on the Hamas charter, people don't actually know what the criticism is. They assume 
that this is basically calling for the destruction for uh, the, the state of Israel um, or, or the fact that this is essentially uh, anti-Semitic. And this is basically invoked by a lot of the critics of the particular uh, movement of Hamas uh, as proof of its failure or inflexibility of recognizing Israel. But the Charter is a historical document. It has to be viewed in a particular historical context, which was the context of 1987 and the time of the First Intifada, where there was no, there was no military might challenging Israel. The Palestinians were fighting against his tankers with stones and sticks and their own human bodies. But that charter, which people don't tell you, they allude to the 87 charter, that was updated in 2006. When, uh, when the updated charter came out in 2006, Hamas, in fact, accepted that they would, they would basically accept a Palestinian state. Hamas stated in the 2006 charter that they would accept the Palestinian state on the 1967 borders, but without recognizing Israel because they believe it's illegitimate. And there's no problem with that. Why should you recognize a state that is founded on the base of illegitimacy? I may add the other point, which the brothers may not know, the ANC government. We are ruled by the ANC government. And there's a lot you probably hear about the corruption and um, untold corruption within government, particularly during the, the Zuma administration itself and so on. But the ANC government was a liberation movement. It, it came up with the Freedom Charter in the uh, 50s. In its charter before the Freedom Charter, the pre-Freedom Charter, I haven't, I should have emailed you that document, the, pre, the, the, the document before the pre-Freedom pre Charter, that basic document of the ANC excluded whites, it excluded coloreds, and it excluded Indians from joining the ANC organization, the ANC Liberation Movement. Now, of course, whites, coloreds, and Indians eventually did join the ANC in the 60s and uh, the 70s and so on during the height of its struggle. But at its earlier stage, it was a, a, a black supremacist organization. Now, Hamas's political vision has also evolved, one must look at it. Initially, at its earlier stages, um, it, 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 you could probably stereotype it as a kind of a Jew-hating movement, but at this particular juncture, or particularly at the point when it won its superficial elections, it, 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 it clearly showed its indication of evolving. The other point is this, is that Hamas in its own accord initially, prior to 2006, it refused to participate in any form of elections in the political process itself. By conceding after the failure of the Oslo Accords, that look, it's willing to participate in the elections in 2005 and 2006, which it won successfully, it offered evidence that it would be willing to function in a modern state and under a democratic uh, system. The other point is this, is that the document, which is known as a Hamas Charter of 87, was long done away with, because if you look at the 2017 Hamas document, which it cites as its own document. Because people, when they talk about the Hamas Charter, they're talking about the Hamas Charter of 87, which Hamas and uh, the Hamas leadership has also rejected. The 2017 Hamas um, um, uh, document lays down its particular principles in a 42-page document. And what its goal is, is simply to liberate Palestine from the Zionist project. It certainly it has a frame of reference um, uh, to Islam, and it's certainly because it's indeed an Islamic movement. But there's no reference uh, at any level to the extent that it's going to destroy the um, uh, people of Israel or destroy the Israeli people. I mean, certainly it's accepted in 2006 that it's willing, if, if, if Hamas has accepted that it's willing to accept the Palestinian state on 1967 borders in 2006. How can that now be viewed as somewhat destructive? In fact, the 1967 borders acceptance is a concession. It was also a concession by the Palestinian Authority, the, the PLO. The PLO initially always spoke about a single state. In 1975, and I was not around in 1975. I don't know if any of the brothers were around. In 1975, that's close to how many years? We're almost in 2025, close to... 
um, uh, 50 years ago, close to 50 years ago, the PLO made a concession that it's willing to accept a two-state solution based on the 1967 borders. That was a concession. And from 1975 right up until 2023, we've always been given to let down the alleyway that, look, Israel has always made these concessions and the Palestinian Authority and uh, Hamas has not. But Hamas has accepted the 1967 borders in 2006. The PLO, before the existence of Hamas, accepted the 1975 borders, the, the, the 1967 borders, way back in 1975. So what are we talking about here? This is basically a game. It is a false charade that is being put before our eyes and that is basically being put as a kind of a wool to deflect us from the real issue. And this is the whole point where Israel always portrays itself as the victim and it portrays those around it as its basic oppressors. I mean, you know, Bassam Yusuf, and I'm not going to repeat the words that he used, but he made the telling point that Israel is like a, an abusive spouse in a relationship. It basically, in his own words, Fs you up and then pretends that it's a victim, like a narcissistic psychopath. That's basically what Israel is. So how far more deeper do you want to go in terms of concession? When the movement which you portray as militant and out to destroy you was willing to accept the 1967 borders, recognize it in its updated 2006 charter in 2006, how can you claim it's out to destroy you? This is a hypocrisy that we basically see. And so I would urge brothers, and um, if you can put up the PDF, I will try and send a copy of the PDF of this particular book, Why Israel? There's a number. These, these books are foundational. Why I say they are foundational, the other book, good books out there, but why they are foundational is because for the layman out there who doesn't want to wade into detailed information by the likes of Nam Chomsky or they find some of the material by Ilan Pape and um, Noor Masalha or Norman Finkelstein, a bit complex, this would be the straightforward material to give the core issues on the point, and I'd be happy to share that information out with you on, on that point. So I think that's basically the, the aspect on, on the issue of Hamas, and I think that should just put the whole situation to bed. The charter the people condemn is the 87 charter, which Hamas him itself has updated, evolved from the 2006 charter. And the 87 charter doesn't even appear on any official documentation of Hamas at all. And even if it were to appear, at the very best, it's a reference to a particular hadith uh, speaking about the end times. It's got nothing to do with it being a direct imperative causing, calling for the uh, you know, destruction or the killing, or the massacre, or every single Israeli out there. I didn't get your next question, brother. Yeah, uh, before we go to the next question, I just want to remind everybody uh, that please continue to uh, like and subscribe to the YouTube channel, and it really helps uh, spreading the dawah, spreading our mission and, and our goals. So guys, don't forget to hit that subscribe uh, icon. And... Uh, there's so much still to kind of discuss, to be honest. Uh, you, you touched on uh, slightly onto the point of propaganda and how uh, the Israeli propaganda, I do feel that it's swaying against them right now. And the yeah. Hasbara, I think the term is Hasbara. Uh, yeah, that terminology, if you don't mind briefly, uh, briefly talking okay. about that. Yeah. Perhaps, perhaps yeah, just yeah. before Brother Yusuf um, um, yeah, uh, sure. elaborates on that point, I just want to um, essentially um, 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 collaborate on the point where Brother Yusuf made mention of how the church will also essentially, uh, towards the end times, um, look to subdue the church of the synagogue. So we have it here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 9, where apparently Christ is speaking, although this is just a nominal understanding, it's actually... What is commonly understood the book of revelation is understood to be the dreams or the visions of um, one of the apostles john which is not really clear who this individual is whether it's um john of zebedee or john the elder or john the apostle this uncertainty as to whoever wrote it but however the passage in it so clearly states in revelation chapter 3 verse 9 i will make those who are of the synagogue of satan who claim mm -hmm. to be jews though they are not but are liars and I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge yes. that I have loved you. So here we see a little indication that 
these very Zionists that probably mentioned who pretend to be Jews but are in fact secularists to the extreme allowing things such as gay, gay, gay pride parades you know it's far from being a, 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 a Jewish state based upon the religiosity of the Torah so here we see those who pretend to be Jews these are the people who will even fall down before Christ, they will be treated as the church of the, as the Satan. Uh, church, even, uh, Satan. Even, before, even, even before that, Brother Mustafa, if you go to ver chapter 2, verse, verse, chapter 2, verses 18, you know, where the angel of the church, these things said the Son of God, chapter 2, verse 18, who had his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine, fine brass, in reference to Christ. And then going on to verse 22, Behold, I will cast her into bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulations, except they repent with their deeds. And I will kill her children with death. And all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the rain and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, of course, there's, there's many interpretations on this particular chapter, and it's, certainly some would view it as a metaphorical illusion. But just for a second, imagine that Hamas included all these references from the book of revelation in his charter in terms of what jesus would purportedly do in the end times on his second coming with a sword sticking out of his mouth and uh, bringing fire and brimstone and judgment on the people would they say the same uh, in relation to the hamas charter so it's a, it's a hypocrisy that that you see it clearly the reference there was totally religious and they use that chapter and it's quite clear that in the context it's referring to zionism and the zionist ideology and not Jewish people per se. I mean, I spoke to Rabbi Absolutely. Weiss. Yeah, this is a fundamental. Did you just one point? I spoke to Rabbi Weiss, um, Yisrael David Weiss from the Netzarai Karta. I did an interview with him about, about, I think, about four or five weeks ago. They met with Hamas officials themselves. Jews met with them. They went to Iran. You know, I've even seen the pictures. He didn't show them on the screen, but they've met with them. So it's quite clearly that this, you know, when, when someone like Douglas Murray says that... Um, Look, the only the the, the 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 hatred and the protest for Israel is as a, as a result of Jew hatred. This is this fall that should this should fall on deaf ears because essentially it's not got nothing to do with Jew hatred. It was it's your anti-Semitic guilt of European society that you wish to superimpose on the Muslim people and on the Palestinians. I mean, Jews and Muslims historically never had any problem with each other. Anti-Semitism is a European construct. Hatred towards Jews is a European phenomenon. It's a European construct, not a Muslim construct. So this is the whole point where the, these lies get called out in the in the longer scheme of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That's a fundamental point that the brother has observed. So we must bear in mind that we must distinguish between uh, you know, being um, anti-Zionist um, and anti-Jewish. There's no yeah. such understanding of Islamic parables which suggests in any way, shape or form there is anti-Jewish sentiment. Um, so this is something we need to be absolutely yeah. clear on. Otherwise, Muslims would not be allowed to marry Jewish women. I mean, what type of religion is supposed to be anti-Semitic or anti-Jewish when it allows Muslim men to only marry Muslim women, which also includes Jewish women? So hence you have that um, anomaly which has been set aside. Yeah, of course. I mean, Jew Muslims, we are allowed to marry people of the book, Jews and Christians believing people of the book. So, I mean, if you're anti-Jewish, does it make sense? How, how, which, by its definition, it's, a, it's like an oxymoron. Anti-Jewish, anti-Semitic means hatred. How would you, how would you marry someone you hate? Meaning, you marry a Jewish woman or a Christian woman, you hate her. It doesn't make sense. So it's like a kind of a, the ultimate oxymoron in relation to that. But coming back to the brother's point on the on the on the question of the the Hasbara, um, Hasbara is a, is a, it's it's a it's a Jewish word. It's a Hebrew word, and um, it basically if I, if I could, you know, it, it basically in reference to what, what I would say, um, a kind of a a brand image. So it's a, Hasbara is in loose terms, a reference to the sophisticated public relations machinery that um, is set up to shape the media coverage of the atrocities that are being committed by Israel. And... Um, this basically is, uh, you know, the aim of the propaganda is to obviously create this kind of obfuscation. So they obscure true meaning. You can take the form of oversimplifying. You can, uh, you oversimplifying by saying, look, you are dealing with monsters and rapists. This is the terminology that is being used by Mark 
uh, Regev and Elon Levi, at least two of the individuals that I see quite clearly. Um, or it could take the form of outright lying, where, for example, they deny uh, the bombing of the hospital and they uh, pointed out and they twisted it, even though one of their own ministers tweeted that there was a Hamas operative and so they targeted, but they denied it because of the fact that there was this media outrage. And so they changed it to say that, look, it was Islamic Jihad that was involved in the bombing of the hospital. So that's a question of clearly outright lying or they dissemble or they create this kind of in, 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 uh, you know, obfuscation in the minds where people don't know what the real situation is. So, uh, you know, where you got someone like Ben Shapiro, the, the whole aim of his particular programming or his, uh, you know, I don't, it's not even good to mention some of these names, but they want to brainwash human minds to think in a particular manner and to basically impose certain kind of illusions. And um, for years, they've had the media to back them up. And when I talk the media, I'm saying the Israeli Hasbara propaganda, which is its own kind of sophisticated public relations machinery, had the support of all Western mainstream media, meaning they had the support of the BBC, they had the support of CNN, they had the support of uh, um, you know, ABC, all the major news networks in the world, uh, in the Western world that is, played a fundamental pivotal role in creating a system that is supportive of this propaganda function. So the justifications are chosen people, promised land, um, the idea of the exodus, Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, and um, more particularly the Holocaust. The Holocaust is always cited, always cited. The Holocaust is always cited. So come October 7th, this is the worst massacre ever perpetrated by the Holocaust. Nonsense. Nonsense. What nonsense? Now the reality of the figures are far much lower because if you take into account that the 420 or 500 were um, uh, civilians, were, were soldiers, that means the balance of 600 were civilians. So it's only about 600 killed. Are you telling me that out of the 600 killed by Israel, by, by so-called Hamas, and they tried to create an analogy that, look, this is the equivalent of, um, of, of, of three times what happened on 9-11, where 3,000 where, where 3, Americans were killed on 9-11. They're trying to draw the moral equivalence that 3,000 were killed on 9-11, 3,000 Americans. The killing of these people in the, on the 7th of October is equivalent to three times of that, which means 30 to 40,000, which is a massive massacre. Well, if that is the case... What then is a what then is a Palestinian? What then is the equivalent of the number of Palestinians killed in Gaza? In if twenty one thousand is equivalent to one percent of the population, then what is one percent of the population in the United States? Do the maths, do the calculations. Astronomically huge figures. So this this this, this Hasbara is this propaganda. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East. The Holocaust, they are always portraying themselves as victims. But um, this is falling aside. This is basically falling by the wayside. Because, because in reality, what you see is, is a kind of a, a psychological projection. Uh, it's like a kind of a, a theory where these people are attempting to defend themselves against their own um, impulses against their own evil by denying their existence whilst attributing it to others. So they engage in the genocide, they engage in the mass murder, they engage in the beheading of people and the burning alive of children and families and hospitals, which is clearly genocide and clearly ethnic cleansing. But they state, like, look, genocide has been committed on us. So you, you can't make this up. It's like Orwellian in nature, double speak. You know what this guy, Winston Smith uh, in 1984, it's like double speak. So for example, they tell you that they are always uh, concerned and caring about the Palestinians. They've made an open pathway for them to move south. But the Palestinians move south. And then what happens? They bomb them in the south of Gaza and they kill them in Gaza. Then when you question them on that, they said, no, we have created another area where Hamas is not. That area is a wasteland, a wasteland to accommodate two million people. So these lies are being fallen apart. I'll give you one classic example. In South Africa in 2011, uh, just after the um, Operation Cast Lead of, um, of 2009, the former Israeli ambassador to South Africa 
Baruch. His name was Baruch. I think Ilan Baruch. He resigned from the foreign service. He resigned completely. He had about 30 years of spin doctrine. And if you look at his letter of resignation, he made, he made a telling point in the letter, which is available to be viewed. Just type in Ilan Baruch, resignation letter, former Israeli ambassador to South Africa. In his letter, he stated that he's no longer willing to represent Israel because the government of Netanyahu has no interest in peace process in the peace process, and he finds it uh, himself in a state of disingenuity to continue basically providing a simplistic defense and a superficial defense of Israel. He also made the telling warning that Israel should take note that the, 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 the way in which apartheid South Africa eventually destroyed itself and self-destructed and disbanded was basically what will one day happen to Israel. And, and I can tell you quite clearly, you can see that there is a, a kind of a paradigm shift. There is a change. There is a change now where even the so-called two-state solution, and I know some people are still calling for the two-state solution. Nobody now is talking about two-state solution. We need only one solution the total and utter disbandment of apartheid state of Israel, total disbandment, that's what we need to call for, total disbandment, all the members of the Knesset, including Netanyahu or the criminal thugs that are running the Israeli Knesset and the Israeli administration, need to either face the Hague or worst case, the guillotine. And um, if you have a situation where Gaza and the West Bank is in a sense amalgamated, now you no longer have the Gaza, you don't have the West Bank, and you don't have the apartheid state of Israel, but you have got one entire country with um, Israelis and uh, Arabs living side to side. And of course, the Israeli population is going to be increasing. And that's what they fear. Sorry, the Arab population is increasing. That's what Israel is terrified of. That's why they want to get rid of them. And they want Egypt to absorb them. And they want the Jordanians to absorb the West Bank. They are terrified that with the Israeli Arabs, with the Palestinians from the Gaza Strip, with the Palestinians from the West Bank, there's going to come a time where the proportionality of Jews versus Palestinians, Palestinians are going to basically long uh, outweigh them by a margin in terms of the population. And when that basically happens, you're going to have a new state. You're going to have a totally new state. Um, you're going to have the equivalence, at the very least, of an apart of, of what happened under uh, the apartheid South Africa, which was also sustained, which was also an apartheid state, which was sustained through all forms of, of um, unjust laws and um, all forms of inequality, and that collapsed. And let me tell you something. Whilst apartheid South Africa was a polecat of the world, um, our own um, minister of intelligence once upon a time, Ronnie Casrells, made the point that apartheid Israel, um, sorry, apartheid South Africa at its height was nowhere near, nowhere near, apartheid Israel at his side. Nowhere near. We had people and black people in townships and the Bantustans. We never had helicopter gunships bombing and destroying townships and blowing them into smithereens. We never, we certainly had um, um, skirmishes. We had massacres that took place. We never had anything close to the massacres and the ongoing systematic genocide that was basically uh, being uh, perpetrated and uh, unleashed in brutal form on the Palestinians. None of that. None of that. Um, we still had a good infrastructure. Um, uh, <laughs> apartheid South Africa was evil. It was in, uh, There was a level of inequality. But uh, blacks still had education. Um, uh, Indians had education. Um, I'm, I, never, I grew up partly as a child under the apartheid um, regime. But uh, we educated ourselves. We never had tanks coming in or whites going into the townships and taking over uh, people's houses and places. Certainly there was displacement, but there was a, the economic apartheid, the, the apartheid continued at an economic level, but it was nowhere near, nowhere close to what you see in Israel uh, today over the past 75 years. Not, a, not an iota, and this has been recognized even by some of the leaders um, in, in, um, in South Africa. I mean, F.W. de Klerk, the last white president, when he was speaking at the Oxford Union and was questioned, and in, in a subsequent interview, I think he was questioned on hard talk by Stephen Sakur, or was it Christian Amanpour? 
and he was questioned was how did he how how did he justify how did he justify apartheid and you know what his response was his response was when israel does it and when israel does worse things than what we did at the height of apartheid why do you never criticize israel and so i think it was christian amanpour was silent check the interview i think it was christian amanpour uh, fw de clerk interview on uh, uh, on, on South Africa, that interview where he questioned on that, the hypocrisy, the double standards, the duplicity. It's because of the fact that the Hasbara is so powerful that the Israelis have embedded themselves in almost all the major news outlets of the world in the entertainment industry. I mean, look at the major entertainment industries of the world. You look at the, the big five. Warner Brothers um, uh, was Jewish. Um, Metro, Goldwyn and Mayer, uh, if they still exist, Jewish. Walt Disney, <laughs> Disney himself, um, I believe was uh, Jewish, Walter Elias Disney. That was his name. Uh, if you look at the uh, some of the CEOs and um, the forerunners at Universal Studios, all the major entertainment industry, all the major uh, news conglomerates and the news outfits, all were run by Jews, but particularly those with a specific ideological Zionist bent. And therefore you found it's been so so easy to sustain the narrative over the decades that Israel is a victim and they, those around them are basically the terrorists and the monsters and they're this benign, benevolent state that is perpetually under some sort of um, uh, constant siege. When it's the other way around, they project on others like the psychopathic husband on his wife, blames his wife for his own narcissistic behavior. That's basically what Israel does. And I think we need to shout it from the rooftops and certainly uh, social media has exploded in recent years. And the alternative media has basically shown the hogwash that this kind of false narrative has basically uh, gone down the you know sewage, as we clearly see in present times, when people can no longer justify genocide. Except those with any kind of without any kind of morality or moral qualms. On those latter points that Brother Yusuf has just made, it's just um, analogous to the points that I've been making on these shows on, on, on a regular basis over the course of the two years, the fact that the media industry as well, the entertainment industry, which has been cited, Warner Brothers mm -hmm. and other such organizations, which came prevalent in the early part of the 20th century, this was, in essence, a systematic attempt to demoral society in general. That was you know, the basis of when um, pictures uh, you know, visual pictures became prevalent for the first time, in which women were, uh, f for the first time in history, exposing their bodily parts. And this wasn't mm. very prevalent uh, upon how the Warner Brothers set about a new moral structure in which they were going to liberalize society um, as the generations continued. And hence we see, um, as made mention, that essentially Israel is a secular state. There is no religiosity within yeah. The, the actual construct of the governance. Although we do have politically minded Jews, we still are at the position whereby the secularists, they decide everything within the system. So this yeah. is actually a state which uh, rather paradoxically, as Christians believe that the Jews must be in Zion um, in the precipice of the coming of, of Jesus. This is a fundamental point which Brother Yusuf may, may be interested in elaborating on. No, so I, th I, think, I think on that point uh, that, that just that, that it's, it's, it's the, 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 the support comes from the, uh, the the Christian right, and indeed the Christian far right, particularly in the United States, and so you've got these tours that are being basically conducted by them and um, to the Middle East, and they believe in this kind of mad, insane idea that that whatever is going to happen is going to you know lead to this kind of potential Armageddon, which will herald the second coming of Christ, and so you've got this kind of support, and I'm I'm even surprised that um, I was going to do a debate, by the way, a couple of weeks ago uh, with Michael Brown, uh, who is who describes himself, although it's fake, but he describes himself as a messianic Jew, although the, what that means is also quite problematic. We were going to set up a debate on that particular issue of the present uh, situation in, um, in uh, Israel and Palestine and Gaza, and certainly the, we were going to look at some of the historical and religious element behind it as well. And at the last minute, he canceled the debate, and the reason for the canceling of the debate was because of the fact that I had made a Facebook post and on my Facebook, because that's where I've been getting the information out to a wide array of people, I had alluded to the idea that um, 
the, those those Christians, basically who support the state of Israel, uh, hypocritically uh, and duplicitously, um, have no shame or qualm when their own particular Christian co-religionists have basically under siege. And I think the allusion there was to the Reverend. I think the famous video you, which you may have seen. I think uh, Reverend Munta Isaac, Reverend Munta Isaac, he gave that famous Christmas Day message from Bethlehem, where he clearly lambasted Israel. And even before that, leading up or after the 7th of October, I made an allusion to that. And at the last minute, he canceled it. So the point I'm trying to say is that there, there, are, there is no, there is no um, solid intellectual or moral case that you can make to support this genocidal state. Um, and unfortunately, sometimes those of us who are caught up in the media or call for interviews get caught up in that uh, particular dictum and get placed unfortunately on the on on the back foot and so you then have to always justify and explain yourself but intellectually morally and religiously uh, there's no there's no a particular basis for the you know there's an interesting book it just came out i don't know if you brothers have ever seen speaking about at least one of our mentors sheikh ahmed didat he wrote a book um, i don't know if it's available in the uk but it's a phenomenal book called Arabs and Israel, War or Peace. This was written during the first intifada. I found this book by chance when I was, um, you know, over the past few weeks, I was reading a bit again, on, you know, uh, since the conflict started and I came across this by, by chance after I'd put this away in my library for some time. But he makes an interesting, interesting argument in this particular book in the sense that even from a religious point of view, um, the so-called claim of Genesis chapter 16, verse 7, I will give unto thee and thy seed after thee all the land of uh, Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Even that cannot be religiously justified. Even from that perspective, cannot. and he goes into a lengthy discourse and discussion on that particular issue. So I'm saying religiously, intellectually, morally, socially, spiritually, <laughs> Israel collapses on all four legs, cannot sustain itself, absolutely nothing. But they've got they've got powerful spin doctors. They've got spin doctors who have a way with words. Um, it's it's the it's the height of irony. It's a double speak that every single Israeli school book today teaches a racist discourse that quite literally wipes Palestine off the map. Maps in the school books only show the Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, from the river to the sea. Palestinians are mentioned in stereotypical racist icons. Um, classified as refugees, primitive farmers, or terrorists. And the reality of the situation is that despite that, that, that position, that reality, it's always the other way around. So you're always confronted. I, I saw some of your really impressive marches in London where people are questioning, what do you mean by from the river to the sea? Well, it's Israel. You know, the, the, the terminology from the river to the sea is actually originally a terminology that was used by the Likud party that they called for the Eretz Israel, the greater Israel, they use that terminology. They never question on that. It's always a Palestinian, it's always a Palestinian pro-Palestinian supporters. About Israel, Palestine being wiped off the map, you always have propagandist narratives about a Hamas teaching Palestinians about how bad Jews are and inculcating hatred for Jews. The Palestinian curriculum doesn't inculcate hatred for the Jews. It's the other way around. And yet in the mainstream media, you get this presentation that Israel preaches harmony. Israel preaches benevolence. Israel is a victim. And the Palestinians and the Arabs are basically involved in hatred towards Jews because it's a sole Jewish state in this whole um, you know, um, uh, siege of uh, Arab hate and hostility. You couldn't make this up. You couldn't make this up. It's doublespeak and it's Orwellian. This is, this is a classic. If you're looking at George Orwell's 1984, Israel is a classic Orwellian state. That's what you got before your very eyes in practical real time, real time before our eyes. Yeah, if you don't mind me uh, just interjecting there, Brother Mustafa, yeah. uh, we've come to the two hour mark and uh, I've got two more questions before we get to yeah. uh, some of the questions yeah. from the audience. Uh, sometimes when you hear these so-called uh, interviews and, and, and taking place on these major platforms, 
Uh, I think George Galloway is doing a fantastic job. He's been doing a job like, uh, in that type of field for such a long time, and he has been highlighting some of, some of the double standards and hypocrisy of the Western government. And sometimes you have people like Piers Morgan trying to justify the bombing uh, and what's taking place, uh, the civilian loss in Gaza to uh, Germany and how the British and Winston Churchill bombed certain mm. cities in Germany uh, and killed, you know, uh, civilians yeah. just to nullify uh, the Nazis and so forth. And also in Japan that, you know, uh, the Hiroshima and, and much more bombs were mm. dropped on to kill out uh, and, and, you know, submit yeah. the concept of that. And also, um, there's a link to this. Do you feel that the same uh, situation was what's happening in Ukraine right now? Do you think NATO and all these governments have they kind of like shunned Ukraine now? Do you think the same thing will take will take place from the Western governments in Israel? Do you think they will be like slowly, slowly? Uh, unofficially swept under the carpet and their support for Israel will uh, will subside and, and reduce? Do you think that will play a part uh, in the future? It, it's difficult to say. What, what I can say is that the... For firstly, with regards to Ukraine and Israel, I mean, Piers Morgan, by the way, was, was one of the first people to condemn uh, Russia uh, for the re invasion of Ukraine. And he called it a war crime. He called Putin a monster. By the way, by the way, the Ukraine war was, what, two years, right? From, I think, February 2022, right up until now, ongoing. More people, more people have been killed, more children have been killed, more women and civilian men have been massacred in seven weeks in, in, um, in, in Gaza than have been killed over two years in Ukraine. This is the gravity of the situation that we are basically dealing with. So I think it, it's a hypocrisy where, where you find, for example, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, crying crocodile tears, talking about war crimes when it comes to Ukraine. When 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 Russia did not even close to the kind of you know atrocious carpet bombing that is being done to Gaza, where Gaza is being you know if you, if you, I don't encourage people to see, but I've seen one of these programs called the the, the Walking Dead, kind of a zombie apocalypse. That's basically what you see there, like literal zombie apocalypse where dogs are eating the dead bodies and the dead remains of Palestinian children being butchered because the families can't come and take them out and bury them because the IDF will shoot them dead or they can't move out of the hospital because they may be shot dead or can't walk out of a church so the two ladies were shot dead outside a church. It's, it's horrific. You cannot make this up in real time. So you see a hypocrisy. I don't think that... Um, the Israeli issue will be swept by the wayside because it's it's been in, in the kind of the public domain on and off for decades. So it's been an issue and nothing basically inflames passions like any other conflict in the world, more so than, for example, even the invasion of Afghanistan or Iraq than the Israeli-Palestinian issue. So you've, you've got three claims there. You've got, for example, the earliest... Um, history of Christianity in that particular region. You've got uh, the, the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which is the masjid, the, 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 that, that's a kind of our spiritual, um, if I want to call it, kind of allegiance to that kind of entire region. And of course, you've got the Israeli so-called uh, religious claim to it, albeit that it is justified on the basis of Zionism, which appropriates religious terms and terminologies for it. So I don't think it will be swept by the wayside or kind of forgotten in the sense that um, that um, you you see what's happening in Ukraine. Although the, the the fact is that you see so much of killing, so much of slaughter, so much of massacre, then there may come a time, and certainly there has come a time where Western media will certainly um, there'll be an ebb and flow, and certainly due to the fact that um, there's a desensitization process. Oh, there are people just dying. What else can we do? We can't do anything. That that may possibly happen. However, this needs to be kept in the public domain. And um, I, I think Israel is on its part of self-destruction. Netanyahu has to complete this. He has to continue with this massacres and the genocide. Because if he doesn't, that will be the end of his career. So he's fighting for his survival. But there will come a time that Israel will have to stop. 
And they know that when they stop, they will have lost. They will have lost, firstly, the propaganda war because of the fact that the people now see in plain sight what Israel is all about in terms of it being a killing state, a terrorist state. Secondly, uh, his own community will be fed up with him because of the fact that they haven't succeeded in getting all the hostages back. And third, they would not have succeeded in defending, in defeating Hamas. Rather, if they you make the argument that, they, look, they're out to target Hamas, they're actually empowering Hamas. They actually are empowering Hamas. So that's the position. With regards to the analogy, I saw, I, I saw this analogy about the bombing of Dresden. And why the analogy is so disgusting and such a disgrace. Well, firstly, the bombing of Dresden can never be justified. It was killing of civilians. That, that, that's a given. But be that as it may, the bombing of Dresden is not even analogous to what is happening because the bombing of Dresden took place after the Third Reich emerged and Nazi Germany was on its mad quest. It's firstly, it was, a, it was a state. It was on its way to becoming an empire. And it had killed approximately 12 million people at the time of the bombing of Dresden. The bombing of Dresden basically resulted in approximately, I think, 25,000 Germans being killed, which is bad enough. But contrast 25,000 Germans being killed with the 12 million that were killed by the Nazi regime. Now, apply that to Israel. How on earth does, how the hell does Piers Morgan apply that to what is happening in Gaza? Because in Gaza, what we now realize is that at best, 600 Israelis were killed at best. The others were civilians. And then others, we don't know who were killed by helicopter gunships. In contrast, and you juxtapose that with 21,000 Palestinian men, women, and children, civilians being killed. So where is the analogy? Where is the analogy to Nazi? Where is the analogy to Dresden? I just don't see the analogy. I don't see. In fact, the contrary position is, uh, is there that Israel is more analogous to the Nazi regime as opposed to the other way around. So there's this, 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 this moral equivalence that he wants to draw it makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. The Dresden argument is a, is a stupid argument. It's a useless argument. It's a poor argument. It's a bad argument. And uh, unfortunately, I see there was one interview where one of our brothers under Lucy, for example, um, tried to show how even the bombing of Dresden was immoral. And I think, uh, I think it was Mohammed Ijab who made the point that um, the, the bombing of Dresden was, was a terrorist act. But that's not the point. The point is that the analogy which Piers Morgan and some of these people are raising, like Douglas Murray, is so fundamentally flawed at an essential level that you can't even make the analogy. You can't make the analogy of killing 12,000 people vis-a-vis -vis 12 million that were incinerated by the Nazi regime. You can't compare Hamas, which is a loose, um, uh, ineffective um, organization that is just simply limited to guerrilla warfare, that has got no army, that has got no military might of the caliber of Israel or even what Nazi Germany had. You can't even make that analogy. So it's a bad analogy in, in relation to uh, the, the, the points that, um, that are being made. But the one point I want to make this, and, and I hope this goes through, I'm a criminal, I do criminal law. And the argument that has been put, and I know that times that we're going to move from Maghreb now, but I just want to make this point. There is an argument that Israel is making that it doesn't intend to target civilians. Now, look at the argument. When they bombed the Jabalia refugee camp, they were going after one Hamas person, one Hamas, but they killed 50 people. But their argument is they don't have the intention, direct intention of killing Palestinians. Palestinians are collateral damage. Now, in terms of criminal law, when you look at the, the dolus, which is the doctrine of intention, there is a doctrine of intention. Intention can take three forms. One is dolus directus, meaning direct intention. Dolus indirectus, indirect intention. Dolus eventualis or dolus indeterminatus. All of that is direct, it, it fulfills the definition of intention. So, for example, when you look at a, at a, at a doctrine called dolus eventualis, if I kill somebody, where a person commits a crime with the intention in the form of dolus eventualis, if the commission of the crime that is a murder, the unlawful act, or the causing of the unlawful result is not the main aim, but he subjectively foresees the possibility that in striving to his main aim, he will commit the unlawful act, and he nevertheless commits the unlawful act 
in such a situation in South African law and in terms of criminal law internationally, you can be convicted of the crime of murder. That is dolus eventualis. So apply that argument to Israel. What is the aim of Israel? If the, what is the commission of the Israel? The commission of Israel is the commission of the aim of Israel is to target Hamas. But in doing so, if, that, if the main aim is not to kill civilians or to murder civilians, but do they subjectively foresee the possibility that in striving towards the main aim, albeit getting rid of Hamas, they will kill civilians, then according to that particular principle, their acts are in fact unlawful. This is unlawful, totally unlawful. So this is the particular point that you could have. Have I lost the brothers here? No, we're here. Uh, we're, we're here. To, uh, are you still there? I think I've lost. Uh, are you brothers there? Because I think Mustafa's somebody... going to Mustafa's going to pray Maghreb. Uh, I'm, okay. I'm here. Well, I'm uh, sorry. Our Maghreb is basically in about twenty minutes, so I've got some time. Yeah. Um, so, so basically, the, the the point I was just before I, I went off. So the point I was trying to emphasize is that is that that argument falls because number one, Israel doesn't just foresee the possibility that in striving toward its so-called main aim, i.e., targeting Hamas, it's going to kill civilians. It knows full well. So when it bombs the refugee camps, does it know it's going to kill civilians? Does it foresee the possibility, or does it know? It knows full well. It doesn't foresee the possibility. It knows. That is going to kill civilians and it nevertheless kills him that is a war crime that is your intention to murder and if you want to call that um uh, that that's not direct intention well well then it's indirect intention it's dolus eventualis and in terms of dolus eventualis it is the intention to kill and you can on an individualistic level be basically convicted of murder on an individualistic level now apply that to israel and apply that tenfold uh, to Israel on that particular aspect. The second point is this, and I just want to end with this, is that Israel cannot make the claim of defending itself. Under Article 51, and the brothers need to know this, under Article 51 of the UN Charter, it only allows a member state to defend itself against another member state. An occupier, uh, uh, can, which is, which is um, occupying territory, can never claim to defend itself against occupied and oppressed people under international law. You take people's houses and lands, you randomly kill them up at times, you lock up small children in jail, and if they fight back, you massacre the whole lot of them, you can't claim self-defense. You cannot claim self-defense. What Israel is doing, so when people ask the question, does Israel have the right to defend itself? The answer is no. Israel has no right to defend itself. The question you're asking is premised on a wrong um, moral quandary that you have to find out because it is only defending its white settler colonial project which is imposing apartheid laws for the past 75 years. I mean past uh, before 7th October I made this point earlier that um, in, the in, the, in the West Bank Israeli settlers torched and burned down three Palestinian towns on the West Bank this year alone with the full support of the IDF. Ramzi Baroud the well-known Palestinian activist Ramzi Barun pointed out that last year there was systematic gang rape and sexual abuse of Palestinian women by Israeli soldiers and Israeli settlers on the West Bank. So well, what are we talking about? It, it's been killing people in droves. Uh, and I think one of your diaries in the UK made the point that if someone is being raped and uh, the, the, the rapist, the, the, the person who is being raped, fights back and kills the rape, the rapist, are you going to go and ask the person, do you condemn the murder? Do you condemn the murder? So the rape victim is killing the rapist, or the, but the rapist has been raping this rape victim for years and repeatedly and gang raping this woman. And the only question you ask this victim is that, do you condemn the killing of this rapist? Do you condemn the killing of the rapist? That is basically what they are. They are defending the rapist. So are we so foolish to raise these particular issues? What happened on 7th of October, whatever the case is, could be a false flag operation, um, could be Israel killing its own civilians. But if it was Hamas, was a, a, a kind of a response to a 15-year siege of a concentration camp and decades, decades of killing of Palestinians. So unfortunately, I'm sorry, I don't buy that argument. 
at all because Hamas, in fact, the spokespeople for Hamas made the point when they, they didn't support the, the so-called rapes that were brought to their attention, which they claim apparently happened. They made the point that um, as an official policy, Hamas and Palestinian resistance groups do not target civilians. If civilians were targeted, of course, from an Islamic point of view, we would condemn it. But they made the point in their public uh, official document, and even Mohammed Daif, who's the, the, the head of the, um, the Izzedin Al-Qasam brigades, made the point that this was in direct response to the desecration of the Al-Aqsa Mosque this year, and Israel, in fact, killing and wounding Palestinians this year. And even the Huwara massacre. Check out the Huwara massacre on the West Bank three days before the October 7th. Nobody would have known about it had October 7th not happened. So he's saying that the reality is that civilians um, are killed, were being killed, was happening before October 7th, is happening now. And October 7th is just simply the green light, the green light to engage in, in massacre that you've never seen, uh, at least in, in, in recent modern times. I think one aspect we also be yeah. looking at the, the possibility. I mean, people in mainstream media, there's also counter conspiratorial suggestions that in some capacity Hamas is active as a wing of the IDF as well, knowing the exact yeah. response that the IDF would do in relation to the events of 7th of October. And you know, there's a YouTube, a very uh, famous YouTube uh, videos of. Benjamin mm -hmm. Netanyahu exclaiming yeah. that they will need to use Hamas for the purpose of making sure there is no two-state solution and you know yeah. diverting the other political path. So, what are your views upon that? Well, look, I've seen and I've seen those. Uh, you know, I did a program for Loving Life TV where those same clips um, were basically um, uh, played out. In fact, it's not it's not just yeah. Even the Times of Israel, uh, the Haaretz papers, and so on have made the point that. Um, for a number of years, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu basically took this kind of approach that divided power between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. And um, what, what the argument is, I don't think it's, it, it is as conspiratorial as some people want to make it out to seem. But it is convenient for Hamas to be there in, in, um, in the Gaza Strip. Because, I mean, Israel is, was, support, was in fact tacitly or... Implicitly, in fact, supporting Hamas, they were giving them um, the, 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 the um, food, the shelter, the electricity, the funds were going directly to Hamas. And, and the point being made is that um, Netanyahu basically, Hamas was also in, included in discussions about increasing uh, the number of work permits that Israel granted to Gazan laborers, the laborers that moved there to Gazans. And so Israel was actively involved in the negotiation with Hamas on those particular issues. And um, with the negotiations with Hamas, there were about, I think, three to 4,000 permits that were, issued to Ga uh, that they were issued to Gazans that were working in Israel. And this was done through negotiations and communications with Hamas. So what the point is that um, the argument that is made that Hamas is necessary to be there because it is prescribed as a terrorist outfit in different parts of the world. And secondly, the existence of Hamas will ensure that Gaza remains fully under siege. So if Hamas, for example, is prescribed internationally as a terrorist outfit, Israel maintains the point that, look, they are being faced with a perpetual existential threat, which is Hamas. There is a schizophrenic relationship that they have. And uh, it suits Israel to have Hamas there because having Hamas would ensure that an independent Palestinian state um, will never basically exist. Um, if you look at the past decade, most of the time, Israeli policy, rightly or wrongly, was to treat the Palestinian Authority as a kind of a burden. And one can talk about the corruption in the PA. And the idea was to treat Hamas as a, as a kind of an asset. Netanyahu made this point clearly. He was, he was quoted as saying, I think um, there was a meeting in 2019 or 2020, that those who oppose a Palestinian state, a legitimate Palestinian state, which Israel opposes and has never allowed, should support the transfer of funds to Gaza because maintaining that separation between the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank and Hamas in Gaza would prevent the establishment of a Palestinian state. So 
it suited them. You've got PA in, in West Bank, you've got Hamas in in Gaza, small strip of 40 kilometers long, and I think 6.5 kilometers wide. Two different factions that are in principle not ideologically the same, that are opposed to each other. And the fact that you don't have now a single unitary, solitary leadership for the Palestinians will ensure that Hamas is sustained, the PA is on the other side, and the Palestinian state will be non-existent. So this is the, the whole point. And um, bolstered by that policy, Hamas, to a large extent, in fact, did grow stronger and stronger by the day. And funds did go to Hamas from the state of Israel. So whether I wouldn't say that Hamas as such was... Um, working as a kind of a front for the IDF, as some right-wing uh, conspiracy theorists would like us to believe. But I'm saying that there was a nexus and there was a schizophrenic relationship where kind of Israel, you know, it's a, cla it's a classic, it's a classic, um, it's a classic program of rule and divide. You know, the classic program of rule and divide. You, you, once you divide people, it becomes far more easier to control them. And then you've got other factions. You've got the Islamic Jihad organization that's there. It is a different faction. I don't know. I think you may also have the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine there. So these are the factors. And so the, there might be some point in that. Yes, brother. Yeah, alhamdulillah. I think Brother Mustafa uh, was discussing, discussing something else with somebody else. I, I did okay. mute him. Brother Mustafa, I do apologize. I think there was some sound coming from yourself. But... Uh, subhanallah, we have to really uh, wrap it up, Brother Ismail. Uh, Yusuf, we really appreciate your time, your efforts, and uh, hopefully we can continue uh, with this, uh, mashallah. Oh, Brother Mustafa, uh, one second. Brother Yusuf, we just lost the connection. Uh, but while I was saying, brothers and sisters, uh, that has been a very interesting uh, stream. It really has been very beneficial. Uh, brother Mustafa, I had to mute you. Sorry, brother. There was some background noise, so uh, okay, apologize. No, no, I apologize. No, sorry, it's not a problem. Brother uh, Yusuf, I think just lost connection. Uh, but I was just trying to wrap the show up uh, because I have to play Maghrib, and of course, in here, yeah, brother Yusuf's back now. Alhamdulillah. Bringing you on now, brother Yusuf. Yeah, I seem to have got cut off for some reason. Sorry about that, brothers. No, no, no yeah. problem. We will be breaking uh, for Maghreb shortly uh, in South Africa, yeah. but uh, it's been, I think, uh, great chatting with you brothers here. I really appreciate the time. I think um, it's important that we, we we create this discourse at the very least, you know. Um, dua is one thing, and I see that there are some brothers that don't even support the idea of protests or boycotts for that particular matter, which is tragic in the United Kingdom. But um, I think we need to create this awareness. We need to create the awareness in the public mind in terms of what is really happening, create this discourse and, 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 and ensure that the average mind, the, the layman, gets to know what we're dealing with, that we're dealing with this monstrous entity. And um, eventually, it will basically play a role in terms of influencing public policy decision making. In the UK, in Scotland, I mean, you've got a, a Muslim prime minister in Scotland that uh, has got family that's in, um, in, um, in, in Gaza itself. And of course, you've got Ireland. Um, the, the Irish, the party of Sinn Féin, and I've seen some of their pronouncements on the issues. So it shouldn't be long. I mean, you almost had one. You had Jeremy Corbyn at one point who could have probably been the prime minister. Um, just unfortunately... I actually, I actually interviewed him, Brother Yusuf, on a oh, did channel. You? Yeah, about, three, four, about four or five weeks ago. I asked I, him about uh, you know, the Zionist plot to actually get rid of him. He was very reluctant to speak about that, as if fearful that if he mm. makes a comment as such, he would be you know, get in further trouble because essentially we all know that he was the one who was going to become prime minister, but they threw out the anti-Semitic um, card against him due to his support for the Palestinian people and due to his general decency. And, um, you know, we, we saw how the uh, media roller coaster machine got into full, um, full motion and they, um, you know, they castigated him as being an anti-Semite. And before you knew it, he was, uh, you know, given a good thrashing in the general election. So the way they work is so tremendous. And I do suggest, I mean, I'm, this is my quick point I'll wrap up, Brother Mohammed needs to, needs to wrap the show up, which is I do suggest you look at a particular British politician here, which you may or may not be too familiar with. with. His name is Michael Gove. I've spoken relentlessly about him on Brother Mohammed's show. I believe he's amongst the most influential British, uh, influential world politicians over the last 
hundred fit well post Second World War. He has formulated much of the current chaos which is uh, developing in this country, for example, the absolute change of universal morality, the advent of LGBTQ education for young children at even primary school level here in the UK. You know, he's the re real major uh, pro protagonist of everything that we see today, which has been turned upside down. And he's an open Zionist. Mm. Yeah, he's an open Zionist as well. He appears on different shows to explain his um, Zionism. And um, I think that's something you should investigate. I've got some excellent information on him. And uh, perhaps when we're off stream, I can perhaps just share that with you. Uh, has, has he not run to become, has he not run to be leader of the Conservative Party? Did he not well, run to the, be That's the esoteric nature of this individual. He's the one who actually decides who becomes prime minister. He's the one who sets po policies. There's a very interesting YouTube video of a particular Labour politician who makes this point. There are only a select group of people who actually um, uh, formulate policies. They decide who becomes prime minister, mm -hmm. for how long they serve, what policies they have, and anything in, in, in which conflicts with that, they'll just do away with it. He's like a. Yeah, I think, I think Cameron appointed him a shadow minister at some point, or shadow. Correct. Shadow yeah. That's right. He was I haven't studied too much on this guy yet, but. No, please do. It's, up, it's absolutely vital that you, I believe that you do so. Um, correct. He was appointed actually education minister in 2005 as well. Yeah. And also, out of interest, he was the individual who. Uh, got rid of, of Suella Braverman, which I will speak to you um, at some other stage about. And he appointed, um, out of interest, full 18 years later, David Cameron as the Foreign Secretary. Wow. Because there was a there's an interesting YouTube caption of actually him the weekend prior to the sacking of Suella Braverman, that he was seen dressed in a suit near to Victoria Station, which is in, I'm sure you're familiar with, in central London, yeah. <laughs> not too far from Parliament. He was, he was dressed up in a suit and he was actually caught um, by some brothers who were filming him who were saying, is, is that not Michael Gove? So he made the decision on a Saturday afternoon, having attended an emergency meeting with um, another one of his cohorts by then, Douglas Smith, who, who was also a very shadowy figure who decides all the governmental policies here in the UK. And uh, before you know it, within 48 hours, Swella Braverman was sacked. So... There are certain things which I'm, I've just given a slight elaboration, but it's very worth you investigating this particular chap and what he's all about as well. You know, he's the real catalyst of, I believe, the events that are even occurring today in Palestine. I certainly will look at that. I'll certainly look into that, inshallah. Uh, thank you, Brother Mustafa. This is a, a, a big uh, topic to unpack. And inshallah ta'ala, hopefully we can continue maybe next week or we can invite Brother Yusuf on again and uh, continue with this topic or uh, another topic of his choosing. Uh, but brothers and sisters, you know, don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, like I mentioned at the start of the stream, that Brother Yusuf uh, is from South Africa and he is part of the, the South African Debate Initiative, which I think uh, Sabil Ahmed, if I'm not... It's, on, it's, a, fled, uh, it's a fledgling channel, um, um, which I formed. Um, basically, after I left the IPC, I, I kind of created a, it's a, it's a non-profit um, entity that is basically there to gear, to host, and uh, have programs. We've been having these, I don't know, Brother Nazam may have shared, we've been having these kind of tag team debates, myself, Dr. Shabir Ali, and uh, with some local brothers, uh, Reverend Samuel Green in Australia. So we've used that as a platform for debate and discussions. It's a fledgling YouTube channel, but... Um, uh, we hope to get some kind of traction. And, um, of course, I'll definitely, hopefully, download this content and share it uh, uh, with my viewers there, inshallah. Yeah, thank you. Uh, certainly subscribe. I would certainly, um, you know, tell the brothers to support your channel. And uh, you guys are doing phenomenal work. And um, I would urge members to, you know, donate, become a member, support this channel, grow it. And, of course, uh, with some of the other brothers that are doing sterling work and, getting this information out there because this is what we need in the public and um, certainly this is uh, somewhat i want to visit south africa and swim with the sharks well <laughs> there's lots of shark nets but we've had one of the largest shark attacks over the decades on the quasimental coast of durban um i think globally but uh, that's under control now we've got other problems we've got other sharks that we are dealing with in the south african context <laughs> yeah Br brother gambit is a, a, a mashallah uh, a member to the channel and a regular viewer and always comes out with uh, interesting statements. But uh, inshallah, uh, maybe we all visit 
uh, South Africa. Very problem, but this would be very likely to prove something which I wanted to very brief, no more than 20 seconds. We're quite, uh, Brother Yusuf, quite fortunate to be living in South Africa where the, the, the government is actually supporting the, the cause of the Palestinians, unlike perhaps any other non Muslim government in the world. So, are we here in the UK, we're curtailed in much of what we can say. As you're aware, we can't even make slogans on the protest, such as from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. The narrative being that, you know, this is causing, um, uh, you know, inciting the um, extinguishment of the state of Israel. So even lunatic, I mean, t crazy type of statements coming from the, the government sources directly to the authorities to stop even such slogans really shows that we are curtailed in mass in supposed um, freedom of expression countries. Yeah, that's true. And uh, I think that's our great advantage. And may just share this, I didn't have the time, but it's quick, that South Africa has now brought an application in terms of the Genocide Convention and it's taken, I haven't had the time to discuss it, but it's a, it's a lengthy 75-page document uh, where they've basically approached the International Court of Justice, uh, you know, calling for declaration that what Israel is committing is genocide, asking for an immediate ceasefire. I may add this point that it, it's the irony because South Africa, apartheid South Africa was one of the strongest allies of apartheid Israel, apartheid South Africa. But uh, post-94 South Africa is certainly one of the, uh, you know, one of the strongest critics. And I think I can credit them as much as I criticize the ANC government on other domestically related issues. Um, I think one can't fault them with the position they have taken. We have, there was a, 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 a parliament a ruling that was passed, um, a resolution that was passed in parliament shutting down the Israeli embassy in South Africa, in Pretoria, although that has not yet been practically uh, exemplified yet, it is in principle. And we still do have a strong Zionist presence in this country because uh, in Cape Town, in other places, and certainly the official opposition, the Democratic Alliance, has been traditionally supported by Jews. So you've got a strong Jewish presence that control the economy here. But from a practical, uh, principle point of view, South Africa has basically come out uh, quite strongly against um, the state of Israel and has taken this up to the International Court of Justice, which should deliberate on this particular issue shortly. And um, this is one of the few times that the genocide convention was invoked and certainly a declaration would be made. It's not the International Criminal Court, it's the International Court of Justice. It has other rules and other regulations. Israel has in the past, as they do generally, uh, rejected some of these resolutions and what they but but once a resolution is passed and a declaration is made certainly uh, it's 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 um it's a particular um credibility in the public eye will fall into abeyance as the days go by alhamdulillah so, just a final question for you brother yusuf you got a youtube channel or yeah the, the, the youtube channel is the i had my own private YouTube channel, which is kind of gone, but the YouTube channel, which we use is called the South African Debate Initiative. So if you go on YouTube and just simply type in South African Debate Initiative, it'll click up the uh, YouTube channel. Um, and that basically has a series of a few programs. It's a, it's a fairly uh, new YouTube platform. Um, I think it was formed uh, sometime last year. And um, it's got about, I think, 48 to 50 videos. They were how it started off after I left the IPCI, the Islam Propagation Center. I had been with a channel in South Africa called ITV, Islamic TV channel, and we had a session in 2021 on the principle on the aspect of Islamophobia. And we had a number of leading uh, figures that I interacted with, one of whom was from your own country, Adnan Rashid, brother Adnan Rashid, and I are quite close with each other amongst others, and um, we then decided to upload the material on YouTube. So this channel was created for that purpose, and so any programs that we do on that and other related issues, uh, political, religious, or otherwise, uh, are there. And um, we're still growing, and um, those can basically subscribe to the channel, share it with others, and we certainly have um, some uh, you know, upcoming programs. We, I was planning to have Professor Rashid Khalidi on the program recently, but he's been inundated with requests for discussions. Rashid Khalidi is the, the professor at Columbia University, the author of The Hundred Year History uh, of Palestine. I urge all the um, viewers to get a copy of that book, or at best, I could email you the set. I, I may just add one thing, and I need to thank this brother. There is a brother from the United Kingdom. I think he was 
I don't know him. I've never spoken to him. But he's a library resource material. His name is Brother Shafia Chowdhury. I don't know if you know him. But he was put in contact with me by Brother Nazam. I don't know the circumstances or the details in terms of how he got in contact with me. But for years now, close to a decade, he's been sending both myself and Dr. Shabir Ali any material that I want. So, for example, I ask him, can you get me the entire list of Robert Spencer's books on PDF? He has it and he sends it to me. Can I get me all the books of Nam Chomsky on PDF? He sends it to me. Um, so I, I think I need to uh, take credit on this station to thank the brother. I don't know who the brother is. I don't know what he does. Uh, but certainly he's been an excellent resource guide. I think Brother Nazam knows him. I'm not so sure if uh, Brother Muhammad or Mustafa knows him. His name is Shafia Chowdhury. And uh, he's an excellent resource material that has been giving <laughs> stuff and material and thesis and academic treatises over the years that I've really appreciated and uh, really made good use of it. So I want to uh, take this opportunity on this platform to thank the brother there. If he's listening, uh, um, I salute the brother. And um, I I'll certainly more than likely share the information with you. And you could probably put up some of the books and materials that you wish on your channel. If you want to put up the genocide convention, the application that's been done by South Africa, I'll send you a PDF link and you could upload that just below your channel and people could download the document and see what it entails and, and contains. That's awesome. And thank you for that. And like, again, uh, it's nice to end up on, end on a positive note. There are some brothers and sisters behind the scenes who helped me with this uh, channel. Of course, uh, Sister Dawa, who helped me with the thumbnail, which Yusuf uh, was impressed by, uh, mashallah. And also Brother uh, Dawood, the servant of Allah, who, who was backstage helping uh, sharing. Thank you, Dawood. And, and uh, our brother Mustafa, uh, see, thank you, brother Mustafa, for helping out and joining us uh, and co-hosting the show. And finally, I'd like to uh, thank brother Yusuf Ismail taking time out uh, for this. And uh, hopefully we can continue our relationship and continue to uh, spread the information. And then, of course, thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making this all possible uh, that we are all linked and brothers in Islam and, and um, working together for the sake of Islam. And uh, thank you to the audience also for contributing. Uh, we had a, like a, a poll uh, in the chat where people have voted and uh, overwhelmingly 77 plus people feel that Hamas is winning the war and will win the war uh, in Gaza. I actually uh, think on that same uh, idea that I can't see the IDF winning at all. Uh, I, I really can't see them. And this is another uh, a topic that we can unpack, inshallah, in the future and uh, hopefully talk through it. Brother Mustafa, any final words from you before we end the show? I'd just like to thank um, you for giving me another opportunity to co host this very interesting show, which was very eruditely and expertly um, decoded by Brother Yusuf. Um, it just gives an undertaking, and I would strongly suggest the audience do watch the show again to take in and grasp all the points so that you can also confidently assert the narrative when you speak to your non-Muslim, particularly um, acquaintances or friends or work colleagues, with the view of then presenting the reality of the situation which is um, happening in Palestine and um, really get the narrative out, because essentially that's all we can do as people. We can't physically stop anything. We, we're, you know, we're... we're curtailed we feel the pain of our uh, our brothers and sisters who are suffering in palestine the situation which has been going on for so many years and the enemy seems to be um you know in control of so many matters but we know the final control lies with the allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we have a um, commitment and a uh, passion to you know forward on these um, mm. very important events which are taking place in history and obviously we're doing this all solely for the sake of allah and um, I do, as I said, would reiterate for the people who have in enjoyed listening to the stream to watch it again and to get the information at hand and then to present it to um, you know the people who are your non-Muslim friends and colleagues. So that would be yeah, like absolutely, that. brother Mustafa. Absolutely, Mustafa. Uh, final words from me, guys, is that you know don't think that you know somehow the battle is being lost. Overwhelmingly, we see people taking the shahada due to what's happening in Gaza, they see the impact of the Muslims and how they are positive even in this 
conf conflict, people, you know, the, the, the brothers and sisters in Gaza, they're thanking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't give up hope in Islam. They continue to uh, practice their religion. And this is having a huge impact on Islam. And Brother Mustafa recently has been taking shahadas of people who have been seeing the conflict and then accepting Islam. Uh, so that's really amazing. And thank you, Brother Yusuf, for your, for your time and your support. And of course, feel free yourself to use the, uh, the, the footage from this channel uh, for your yeah. channel and, and spreading uh, the message. Uh, Jazakallah khair. Jazakallah khair. And Allah reward both of you brothers and the brothers in the background and the sister. And uh, may you basically increase spiritually from one level to the next, inshallah. And may Allah shower his blessings and mercy on our brothers and sisters in Gaza at this point in time. Jazakallah khair. Mm -hmm. Amen. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.